Welcome everybody. Um, this is a special meeting of the Maine Municipal Water District Board of Directors for Tuesday, May 28, 2019. And uh, welcome. This is our rate hearing, as you all know. And uh, we have posted the agenda. We have one member who is calling in. That's uh, Cynthia Kohler, Director Kohler. So she'll be chiming in uh, by a telephone contact. Can you, Cynthia, you there? Okay, very good. Okay, so the first order, the first order of business for the board is to adopt the agenda. Is there a motion to so adopt? Second. Okay, roll call vote, please. Director Russell. Director Russell. Aye. Director Quintero. Aye. Director Gibson. Aye. Director Kohler. Aye. President Bragman. Aye. Uh, the next item on the agenda is directors and general managers' announcements. Um, are there any announcements by board members? Director Russell, no. No, nope, I have none. I have none. Ben? Okay, there's none. Aye. So, uh, I'm sorry, Director Kohler, do you have any? Cynthia, could you repeat in sum what you just said? We had a little, uh, the volume wasn't up enough for folks to hear. Oh, I'm sorry. I know that um, this is an important meeting, and I just want to be here and say that I'm able to participate in my phone. I'm in Denver for an unreasonable work. Hold on a second. Can we turn? significant conversations about whether we could reschedule the rate meeting to accommodate my work schedule, and we decided not to, and that's why I Okay, we've got a little bit of a technical um, challenge. The volume on your connection is not really adequate, so. You turn the speaker. My no, no. Look at this here. Oh, I see. The speaker is turned back. Yeah. Okay, let's try a third time. The big button, you have to hold it down the whole time. The big button, yeah. Director Potter, could you please repeat? Sure, I'm, I'm sorry. I simply wanted to say that I wanted people to know that um, I am not there because I'm in Denver on an unavoidable work meeting that could not be rescheduled. We had considerable conversations about this at the district. So I simply wanted people at the meeting to uh, know why I'm not there um, in person and that I appreciate the efforts of the technical staff at the district to accommodate my work schedule and to allow me to participate remotely. So I appreciate the, uh, the effort. Thank you. Okay, I think we've got your volume uh, fixed, so you can participate much better now, okay? Okay, so um, the first item and only item on tonight's agenda is consideration of Agenda 442, which amends provisions of Title VI of the MMWD Code. So is this going to be handled by you and Charlie Jenner? Okay. President Bragman and board members, Tonight, staff brings you the proposed rate increase as described in the staff report with details in the draft ordinance and highlights in an upcoming presentation. This is a culmination of over two years of work by staff, working with the board and the public as well as benefiting from support from technical, financial, and legal experts. This rate proposal meets your direction to ensure the rates are fair and equitable for our customers and that the rates are based on the cost of service to do the work of the district. There has been extensive public outreach with about 25 public meetings 
over just the past six months in a community advisory committee put together to review the approach and provide the board with feedback. This rate increase will ensure we meet our obligation, our duty to the community to provide safe and reliable water, appropriately invest in our infrastructure, and maintain the health and vitality of the watershed, including doing our part to address the growing threat of wildfires. So with that, I'll turn it over to our treasurer and manager of administrative affairs, uh, Charlie Duggan, to provide you with a brief presentation. Good evening, members of the board. Tonight I'll discuss some of the key facts regarding, regarding the district's water system, the finances, and the rates. Let's start with how complex our water system is. We all know about Mount Tam and the extensive watershed land that the district manages. We also have 900 miles of pipeline, which if you laid end to end, would take you from San Rafael all the way to Yellowstone National Park. We have 128 storage tanks, 97 pump stations, uh, reservoirs, dams, uh, treatment plants, all delivering water uh, to our customers. As you can see, the complexity in the district system uh, is the kind of complexity you would find in much larger uh, agencies. When we compare our rate proposal, you see the blue bar on the left side, uh, the fourth one over is our, our current rates. Uh, this is for a 5 8 inch meter, which makes up about 64% uh, of all of our meters uh, and uh, 70 plus percent of our single family residential meters. Uh, with this rate increase as proposed, we'll move that blue bar over to the right blue bar uh, and you can see uh, there are still a number of agencies here in the local Bay Area that have rates above us, uh, such as San Jose Water, North Marin Water District for West Marin, the City of Palo Alto, San Francisco Public Utility, um, and uh, Mid Valencia Peninsula Water District. If you look at our rate history, these bars go from 1990 on the far left all the way to 2021 and the green bars signify years where there was no rate increase from the previous year. And so there's a number of them, uh, 14 or 15 over the last 25 years where there was no rate increase. If we were to adjust our tier one rate starting in 1990 according to the CPI for the San Francisco Bay Area, we would actually track along this gray line that goes from left to right and ends at $4.46. The current proposal will take us to $4.19. And so uh, we're actually below what the CPI, if we had followed it every year, um, would, would take us to. The above line is from the AWWA, the American Water Works Association National Rate Survey. Every two years they do a national rate survey and they track the increase in costs to water agencies throughout the nation. And what we're seeing is that there's a lot of old infrastructure throughout the nation that needs to be replaced and that's driving costs uh, for a lot of other agencies, not just us. When we look at where the money is going, uh, this pie chart shows you, if you start at the green where it says watershed 6% and go all the way over to the green across the top clockwise uh, where it says water purchase 7%, you're looking at about 70% of our expenditures on direct water services, uh, the pipes, the water treatment, all of that. Um, the rest of it is made up, if you had debt service to that, which also paid for infrastructure projects directly for the water system, you're at about 80%. The rest of it, you have administrative services, retiree costs, customer service, and water conservation. So tonight's rate proposal really has two major components. Um, one is a 4% revenue increase to keep pace with the increase in costs we find on our operations and maintenance needs, and a new capital maintenance fee to fund ongoing investments uh, to replace 
the 100-year-old pipes that we have or to upgrade our uh, treatment plants to handle seismic events. Uh, the reason we're proposing these rate increases are uh, to replace the aging infrastructure, to responsibly manage our watershed, and continue to deliver water that everyone counts on every minute of every day for the year. So the customer impact uh, is shown on this slide. Uh, the, the top rows show the breakdown of service charges, watershed management fee. Uh, when it comes down to it, that 4% revenue increase that I talked about, this is for a 5 8 inch meter at the average of 17 CCFs uh, per bi-monthly bill. The monthly increase is $2.71 on that. When you add the capital maintenance fee of $13.63, it's a total increase of $16.34. For the one inch meter, we're showing a $5.36 increase on the bi monthly, on the monthly to monthly uh, equivalent. Uh, and then when you add the capital maintenance fee, it's a $39.42 increase. Overall, the capital maintenance fee is broken up and, and Portioned by meter size. Uh, this chart shows what the charges are per meter size, and so the fourth column over from the from the left uh, shows that for a five eighths inch meter, it's a dollar sixty three and fifty cents on an annual basis. Uh, for a one inch meter, it's four hundred eight dollars and seventy four cents. All of this is based on the capital costs of uh, the yearly capital cost for the district. Uh, which are sixteen and a half million dollars. So let's talk about what we're going to be doing in the next ten years and what the capital maintenance fee is intended to fund. Uh, if you look at uh, in today's dollars, it's about two hundred and eight million dollars planned. Uh, if you escalate that at about four percent a year, it comes up with two hundred and forty million dollars, forty one million dollars of planned. Uh, improvements, but they're not really improvements by upgrading the system to handle more capacity. These are improvements to take care of maintenance issues for 100 year old pipes, pump stations that are quite old, a reservoir that I'll get to that's over 100 years old, those types of things. Uh, so we have $112, uh, $112 million planned for pipelines, pump stations, and the distribution system. The storage facilities are looking at $30 million. Control systems, $12 million, and on. The watershed, we have $36 million planned uh, in spending for the watershed, which includes a million dollars out of the $16.5 million of the capital maintenance fee, or the CMF, uh, dedicated towards fire and fuel reduction and fire protection uh, to ensure the quality of the watershed is protected from a major wildfire. So when you look at just a few of our projects, the treatment plant upgrades in the upper left-hand side, $20 million dedicated towards hardening our treatment plants against a seismic event. Uh, I saw something uh, uh, that we had, uh, if a major seismic event happened, we might be out for several months. With these upgrades, we could be back and running within maybe a week or two. And so that's, that's the plan, is to make sure that we're back in, in the water business. Replacing 50 miles of pipe at about a million and a half dollars per mile of pipe, we're looking at $96 million. Uh, Smith, that, Smith Saddle tanks are overdue for a, a complete uh, renovation, uh, which includes going in, repairing any metal that's deteriorated over time, recoding it all, and hopefully getting another 20 or 30 or more years out of out of those tanks. And then finally, to replace the Ross Reservoir. This is a reservoir. It's a one million gallon tank that's over a hundred years old, and uh, this picture doesn't even do justice to the state and condition it's in. Uh, it does need to be replaced and uh, that would cost $16 million. So when you look at our facilities, we're the oldest water district in municipal water district in California. Uh, that means we have actually um, equipment and infrastructure that predates the beginning of this district because 
It was first comprised of a lot of other districts that were merged together. When you look at our treatment plants, we have three of them. Uh, two of them are greater than 50 years old. Our storage tanks, 55 of them are greater than 50, 50 years. And of those 55, 11 of them are actually older than 75 years. The pipelines, 439 miles of the 900 miles are older than 50 years. And 76 of those miles are older than 75 years. And for our reservoirs, five of them uh, older than 50 years, and three of them, three of those five older than 75 years. So this was, these pictures are from a main break that took place uh, in June 2018. 212 gallons of water were released. It's an eight inch cast iron main, uh, 65 years old and uh, the cost of the repair was $36,000. Uh, what's significant is a lot of the water, the 200,000 gallons, flew into a stream and that resulted in a fine from the fish kill of $285,000. Uh, these main breaks are quite expensive and that's what we're trying to uh, halt when we're replacing the pipes. We pro uh, we conduct at least 150 main repairs each year. From, and that means a main broke and we go in and fix it. So the wildfire risk at the watershed. Well, our primary concern is the water quality and making sure that the watershed is protected because that's our first filtration system into the reservoirs. However, we do have 25,000 structures within two miles of our watershed. So if a fire were to occur in the watershed, uh, being a good neighbor, we want to make sure that it doesn't extend over our, our lines. But also it's very important for our water quality. Uh, the CMF will add an additional one million per year in fire fuel reduction. And in the proposed budget you have, over the next two years, watershed funding will increase an additional $1.6 million. So we've had a number of questions that have come to us over time, and I thought I would address some of those for the benefit of the beer, uh, for, for the board. What, what is our public process in getting here tonight? Well, we've conducted or presented at 30 public meetings, ranging from board meetings uh, at MMWD to visiting all the city councils uh, within our district, also meeting with local, the local Realtors Association, Rotary Clubs, other community groups, including two public rate workshops that were conducted in the last month, month and a half. Uh, 79,000 notice letters were sent out by the district uh, notifying people of this event's notice. So why do we use the meter size for the CMF? Well, capital costs are funded for basic infrastructure improvements and are required to provide capacity in the system. Uh, capacity in the system is represented by the capacity of meters and therefore the capital cost that will be collected annually either on the bi-monthly bill uh, or annually on the tax rolls or bi-monthly for the first two years uh, represents the total capacity of the water system when you look at the meter sizes and uh, they're a measure of the demand that a customer can place on the system. A customer with a larger meter has the capacity to significantly have higher water demand as opposed to smaller meters. Uh, it is a very common practice in the water utility industry to use meter size to apportion fixed costs this way. So why do we ex exclude the fire lines from the CMF? Well, private fire service lines are not seen as an overall capacity issue for the water system infrastructure. These lines are only supposed to be used in the extreme and unlikely case of an internal fire event. Uh, and similar to not charging a fire hydrant uh, CMF fee, these lines are essentially dedicated fire hydrants to a building. Uh, the uh, accounts that do have a fire service uh, do have a fire service charge that accounts for things like reading the meter and any other administrative costs we have associated with that. So how do we address affordability for low income customers? Well, to address the impact of the rate increase on low income customers, the ordinance includes an increase in the qualifying threshold 
from 60% to 80% of the housing and urban development low income guidelines from Marin County. How do we address meters upsize for non-consumption reasons? Well, we've created a process which is included in the rate ordinance whereby rate payers can fill out an application and uh, the, the district will do an assessment of the meter size and the um, non-consumption needs that the house has. Um, and they will look to, uh, generally, those non-consumption reasons are fire sprinkler installation. That's the vast majority. In small cases, it's a severe pressure differential uh, that they have to accommodate for. Uh, in granting an adjustment to the CMF, uh, it will lower the meter size charged one level. So if you have a one inch meter, a three quarter inch meter would then be charged. If we can determine and establish that a one inch isn't required for that house. The district will also assist ratepayers who have a larger meter and wish to decrease the size to save on fees if, they're, uh, if they have the ability to go to a smaller size. Why collect the CMF on the property tax bill? Well, the draft ordinance includes that the CMF will be on the bi-monthly bill for the initial two-year and then transition to the property tax bill after that. The CMF is a fee dedicated to maintaining infrastructure towards preserving water, current water quality and current system capacity. The district sees these activities as primary benefits to property and therefore property owners and therefore on the property tax statement. How does the proposal incentivize conservation? Well, in, in addition to the tiered water rates, whereby higher amounts of consumption face higher per unit charges, the proposal includes a super water saver program where 3,000 single family households who, who use the least amount of water, uh, it will deliver an $8 credit on those bills uh, for those accounts. And that will be judged on a monthly, on a bi-monthly basis, and that will be awarded to each of the accounts that qualify. So, um, you might be also interested in our protest process. Uh, I mentioned earlier we sent out 70, 79,000 notices. Um, when we receive a protest, we date stamp the, pro the protest with the date for when it was received. We stamp it with a, uni a unique number for tracking and identification. And then we check for the required information, which are written protests must identify the parcel number or utility account number or address for which the protests are submitted. Written protests also must include a signature of the recorded property owner or utility customer and a statement that the person is opposed to the, to the rates, fees, or charges. We validate by comparing to the Marin County database of parcel owners and our own database of customers. Validating, uh, validations are then double checked by our legal counsel to provide for quality assurance and quality control. All protests are scanned and filed with their unique, by their unique number so that we can always reference them. Available for public inspection is a binder that we keep of protest letters with the personal information from each letter redacted. We use the board resolution 7799 which adopted guidelines for processing these protests. All original protests filed are filed for future reference and we keep them <coughs> on hand. Uh, as of about an hour ago, we had 1,445 valid protests, uh, which equals 2.5% of the 57,342 parcels served. In order to have a majority of protests filed, we would require 28,672. Uh, we did receive 128 invalid protests, and some examples of invalid protests would range from Two or more protests from the same parcel, we only count one of those protests. Uh, there's no signature, which is required by law, or something like protests received for a post parcel located outside the service area. We did receive a number that uh, are for parcels that we don't serve. So in summary, we've been working on this for about two years with input from the board, from staff, 
financial, technical, and legal experts and customers. Tonight's hearing is the culmination of over 30, actually fairly recent, public meetings. MMWD is proposing to raise the water rates to protect our aging infrastructure and replace uh, that is, which needs to be replaced, to manage our watershed responsibly, and to continue to deliver high quality water. The recommendation from the staff this evening is that the board conducts the public hearing, approves resolution 8538, and adopts ordinance number 442, uh, which amends section six pertaining to the water service rates and charges of the Marin Municipal Water District. Are there any questions? Okay, thanks very much, Charlie. So, no questions? Any comments from the board before we take public comment? Okay, um, go ahead. Um, I've been thinking a lot about the water saver, super saver rate, and it seems to me that we should consider modifying the super saver to include a set aside for the CMF so that the people who achieve that super saver rate are the CMF that they receive is for the five minutes inch meter. And in that way, uh, they're rewarded for their water conservation and they pay a, a fair fee, but not necessarily the size of their water meter, depending on what that water meter would be. Could you repeat that? Sure. Uh, what I said was that the water super saver rate currently refunds a portion of their billing per month. And what I would propose is that we modify that to include the refund of that portion of the, of the payment, but also to add on a reduction in the CMF so that regardless of the size of their meter, it would allow us to apply a 5 8 inch meter charge to their bill. So if they have an inch or an inch and a half meter due to fire sprinklers, and they're in the lower 5% of our water users, they're rewarded for being a water conserver, and the reward is both the, the rebate on their bill, but also a reduction in the CMF. Okay. Okay. Ben. In thinking about this, I would offer an approach whereby um, we think of the Super Saver program to some extent similar to our long-standing low-income program where over time it's been refined and of continuous improvement as we understand it better. What we could similarly, in this case, bring back to a subsequent board meeting, options and alternatives, if that would meet your interest and discuss it further. Absolutely. <clears throat> Any other board member comments? Um, I've got a couple. Um, just suggestions um, for the board and for the consideration of the audience. The first is I'd like to see the fee proposal come back in two years so that we could take a look at it in two years instead of four years. Um, so we could really see the impact of how this rolls out. So that would give you, give our customers greater confidence in how we're looking at this and the fairness of it. Um, the other suggestion I have, and I think it's just kind of a drafting omission, is to include some kind of um, language in the ordinance that gives the public confidence that these funds will be accounted separately as we've done with the watershed fee. So that can be added quite easily so that the public will have a separate segregated accounting to see how the money came in, where it was spent on specific projects. On the first item, 
the four-year check-in check -in period that we had um, been directed by the board to plan for, we could, um, if the um, board is inclined to direct staff to shift that to two years, I don't believe it's in the ordinance and would require any change to the ordinance. We would just take the board direction on that item and proceed with a two-year public review and check-in process on the fee. On the second item, I think similarly, um, I would take legal advice whether you would advise if the board was inclined to direct staff to, um, to instruct staff to ensure we have a dedicated separate accounting system for this fee, if that would belong in a ordinance language or we just take direction from the board. Remember, you used on the watershed fee. Yeah. My memory is no. that? No. Oh. How's that? <coughs> uh, my memory, that's what my memory is on the watershed fee that we wrote a simple finding uh, at the into the ordinance, not into the body of the code, but but into the ordinance. That's easily accomplished. And then one other thing is in regard to our sister public agencies, this is more of a direction whether the board would be agreeable to beginning a program of cooperation to do water audits on our sister public agencies and really do um, sort of an active um, assistance with them to reduce their water usage, see if they can reduce the size of their services, see if we can help them as far as their irrigation and, and other uses. Um, uh, Director Kohler, do you want to chime in now? Five minutes if you're representing a group, and I'm going to call the speakers in order of the cards that I received, okay? So the first speaker is, um, I can't pronounce the first name, uh, Falia M. Franco, 31 Carroll Street, or Carroll Court, in San Rafael. that you have given us, this little notice here. I believe that if you really intended to raise the rates so high, we need a whole form attached to this, complete with why we should protest here, how we would benefit. I know that you have all this, and I appreciate your uh, presentation very much. And Mr. Russell's proposal, too, I appreciate that. But really, I just noticed this is the form I'm supposed to know today, you know. And I know you send it to hundreds of people, but how many people would respond? I think a better way would be that you send the forms to have the voters approve the increase rather than we protest your we already proposed increase. Thank you for your time. 
Uh, I'm just going to point out, under Prop 218, there is a specific exemption for water utilities, sewer districts, on putting fee increases on the ballot. So there is that distinction with Prop 218. And who paid for that? Doesn't make it right. And who paid for that? Just, just a point, just a point of information. Okay, our next uh, two, and we can maybe start lining up. Next is John Sargent, John, and then after John is Marjorie Shank. John Sargent, Fairfax. Uh, I want to thank you for uh, moving this meeting to the larger area so that everybody has a chance to, to listen to uh, what you're proposing. I have no problem with you basing charges on meter sizes. The only justification seems to be it's an industry standard and everybody else does it. That doesn't make it right. It doesn't make it right at all. Um, I also have a problem with uh, putting these charges on the, on the county tax bill. Um, as you well know, a lot of people don't particularly pay too much attention to those tax bills. Um, so it would be much fairer if you put those charges on the water bill itself, not the tax bill. Thirdly, um, I would hope that in some fashion you start televising these these meetings, because uh, I almost think you're almost scared to do it for some reason. I don't understand why it's not being done. Um, everybody can't attend these meetings, you know, on a regular basis, and it would be a, a, a extreme public service if you would arrange somehow to get these meetings televised. Thank you. Marjorie Shank. My husband and I have lived in Marin County for over 22 years. During that time, every time we turned around, our water bills were being raised, and we'd conserve more, and the bills just kept going up and up and up. One question I have is, where is all the money gone that we've given you, besides going to pensions, benefits, salaries, which are all too high? on a ratio basis compared to all the other people. Okay. Um, I do not, just like the previous gentleman said, want you to have any control on my tax bill, put my water bill on there. It doesn't belong on there. You, I will lose all control over what you do on this board if you put it on my tax bill. I have no recourse. You cannot do that. It's not fair to the taxpayer. It's not fair to the ratepayer. Okay? You need to deal with these things. And uh, another question. Uh, if you're going to do this infrastructure, which has been denied and postponed for decades now, as you did whatever you did with all this money we gave you so far, why don't you go to Bond and at least level it out rather than stick a $409 bill plus a 4% a year on for the next of my life? Okay? They're all questions I'd like answers to. In the last 10 years, we've spent over $200 million on infrastructure. Um, that's where a lot of this money has gone, and a lot of that money has actually been gotten by the district through the issuance of bonds, where we were able to get a tremendous amount of work done. I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. Could you put some pictures up there and show us what you've done? We, we actually have reports that show the numbers of miles of pipe. Charlie actually covered a lot of it in his presentation. Could have started there. We'd like to know what we've done. Before we get into the problems you're having now. Okay, I, I don't know if we can go through that, but you know, the fact of the matter is these capital improvement projects have been done. They're on the website. Um, they're in the report. There's been over $200 million in capital improvements done in the last 10 years, most of it by bonding. And that's kind of what's brought us to this fork in the road, is that we've, we've reached a point where further bonding, 100% reliance on bonding, is not sustainable. And we started going towards a cash 
financing of capital projects about three years ago. So we're sort of at the culmination of this journey. But it's, it is a path that we started several years ago. And the fact of the matter is that we have spent, this agency has spent well over $200 million in the last decade improving the system. And it, it is a process that basically has to go on because our, our system wears out. It's like any other mechanical system that over time needs to be fixed, replaced, and improved. So that, that's what we're trying to deal with. We're trying to get to a sustainable financial structure. And it is not easy, as you know, and as I, you know, I, I, I do understand your concern. I think we all do. Um, next speaker is Richard Owen. <laughs> I'm as old as your old damn system. Not if we're talking to you. I'm not still thinking so we can't Let me do one thing. How many people are here who want to see a rate increase? And how many don't? Raise your hand if you don't want to see a rate increase. So there's your form, right there. Your outreach to us, versus the lady over here, to have us respond to you whether we want to have this or not, is so one-sided and so unfair in your favor. Take your little card, put it in your billing kit, and say, this is our case. Do you want to spend the money, or don't you? And then read these cards, as opposed to putting us into putting up letters and all the rest of it. And the rest of it, let me just go through some points. You talked about complexity. The complexity of your system has been that complex since I moved here in 1968. It's worked all the way up until now, and I expect it to continue to work. Your rate comparison. You still want to charge us more than Santa Rosa based on your own chart. So your rate comparison doesn't wash for me. Your retiree plan. My buddy was a postman in one of these towns for 35, 40 years. His pension is half of what you pay your pensioners in this uh, situation. Uh, upgrade for seismic events. All right. You've got two events coming here, not just seismic. You've also got a water rise. So you've got global warming, if you haven't noticed. And you haven't noticed what's going on in the Midwest. You're going to harden sewage plants, which are going to go underwater. You're going to strengthen things, which will be worthless to this community at some point. We, we, sir, we're not operating that end of the system. Our water treatment plants are not sewer plants. They're not located on the coast. According, according to the uh, last board meeting I met, went to for all the supervisors in this county, your plants are in jeopardy. And by the way, you also operate the sewer plants because we pay our sewer bills based on the information you provide to the sewers districts. And we've got, and we've got 16 or however many sewers districts in this county that need to be addressed. So you need to address the seismic area, you need to address the complexity of your sewage agencies, and when it comes to fire, there's not a single representative in this room from PG&E. PG&E and you have got to get together and work together about fire. You can't just look at it at one side, you've got to look at it both sides. In terms of what you're asking us for today, if I run the numbers, Charlie, you're asking everybody in this room for another 800 bucks, 800 to 1,000 dollars over the course of four years. If you add those numbers up, that's what they compute to. You can do that while I'm talking. Uh, only a million dollars for fire safety? It seems like not enough to me, uh, based on what I saw uh, in the fire uh, Review meetings we've been having in Wayne County in the last. Sir, we but have a I, lot of speakers. I understand. The last thing I'll say, I've attended the meetings. The last time I attended the meeting, you were here. Right? I was here because you were raising the rates because we had obeyed your demand that we reduce our water usage, but we were in a drought. And then you came at us and said, you did what we asked you to do, but we're going to have to raise your rates because you did it. It's this, it's this type of thing that makes it impossible for me to have faith in you guys. Okay, thank you very much. Next speaker is Steve Shank, and after him is Jack Freckman. Uh, good evening, I'm Steve Shank from Mill Valley. I've uh, been here 22 years. Actually, it's more than that. Uh, I would like to criticize the uh, governance of this process. The opt-out is unfair. Uh, the carving, the uh, 
covering out the 68 percent of people who will be have a minimal impact, so they don't have to be, be concerned. It's unfair. It, I would like to ask the people behind me, how many people here think that the board is going to ignore them, ignore all this comment, and do whatever they feel like? Everybody. Everybody. That's a, a failure. I'd also like to criticize the uh, meter approach. Our house is in the uh, tier one every month, every two months. But we have a, a one inch meter because that's the way it was built. We didn't ask for it. We, didn't, we had no choice on it. We didn't think about it when we bought the house. We don't run all our speakers at the same time. We don't take showers at the same time. Everything is, is done in a, the same as it would be if we had a half inch meter or five inch inch one. That is unfair. To give us a, a choice to put a some, some, a device on our uh, system to uh, reduce the flow because we don't need it all. Uh, we did we did that for our showers, but is there, is there a way to do that? The answer is no. You, you don't offer that kind of option. I'd like to be able to save money because of this bad approach you have. Thank you. Thank you. Jack Freckman is next, and then Basha Crane. Yeah. Jack Freckman Woodacre, I yield my time back to this gentleman here. Okay. So back to you. Uh, you know, I mean, here and there. That's four dollars a month times twelve times four. Is that about right? In other words, you're not you're not asking us for just four bucks. You're asking us for my computation is about eight hundred dollars. Everybody in this room and more, depending on the size of their meter. Is that about fair? I mean, don't look at it Look at it as what we're actually going to be forced to pay. All right. In terms of your sewerage district. Do how many sewage districts do you think you have in this county? Uh, and you feed all of the information. Thirteen. Thirteen. Thirteen in a county the size of, of, of Marin County. Thirteen separate districts with payrolls and people. And you're part of that equation for you to find the water that makes the sewage system work. Is that right? Is that right? One way it has to come in and go out, right? Okay. <laughs> for you get for some of these. You get up on the stage and you say, we're here to provide you pure, potable drinking water. May I ask you what other kind of water you have in mind? <laughs> As if that's some kind of gift. And by the way, you have recycled water that we provide. Pardon? There is recycled water that's provided up in the north from Los Angeles. Can I put recycled water in my garden and how would I get it? You have to be within the distribution network. It's pretty expensive to put in, but we pretty have, expensive to put in. But we have looked at how we can extend this so that people can use water that's not potable for irrigation and other non-consumptive uses. Have you talked to our local banks and see if they'll help the homeowners finance that? Have you been entrepreneurial in any sense of the imagination about how to make this thing happen? It's My son works in, down in, in San Francisco, and he's in the digitization, the fourth <coughs> industrial revolution. You should be able to deliver everything you're doing for less money, not more money. You should have a way of doing that. You should have a way of monitoring your systems so those breaks don't surprise you the way those other breaks did. And you don't have to pay fines. All of that technology is available to you now. You've got to start thinking entrepreneurially. And you've got to reach out to this community and make us your friends, not your enemies. We're on your side. You just want to do it better than you're doing it. Thank you very much. Basha Crane and then Richard Harris. Good evening. Uh, my name is Basha Crane. I live in Kentfield. Um, I want to approach this from a different angle. The bottom line here is that MMWD doesn't have a uh, revenue problem. It has a spending problem. Uh, your operating expenses in the last 25 years have risen 300%. Uh, your latest uh, capital plan proves that this board has an inability to prioritize spending proposals. Some of these things you have in there can be put off for a longer period. Uh, Richard Harris, who has had a 40-year career in public finance 
and investment management, sat on this board in 1993 when MMWD had a $12.5 million annual profit. And then when he came on the board, your rates were the second highest in the United States. And he turned things around in a, a couple years where you had a $12.5 million profit. So I'm sure that your board directors read his Marin Voice piece. Uh, it was in last week's IJ. And he said that the next necessary step is convincing this board to appoint and work closely with an expert financial committee. Hopefully the board takes his advice into consideration. Uh, he mentioned three other things and they're very brief. Number one, the five areas to be funded by the capital maintenance fee are what any municipal utility district would consider normal operating expenses, payable out of operating revenues. Two, large non-reoccurring investments should be financed through long-term tax-exempt bonds which is not what you're not doing. And three, you may not like this, director's compensation, which averages about 30,000 per director a year in, and includes benefits, health benefits, should be eliminated. That was his recommendation. So, I want to say that no board no board has the right to spend taxpayer money the way it chooses. You can't just go around choosing the way you're going to do it. The public officials have a fiduciary responsibility to spend prudently and to produce the most public benefit. If this board devoted 80% of its time to solving the budget problem, it would be a good thing. And, or maybe we need term limits. Thank you very much. Richard Harris? Yep. That's embarrassing. Uh, th thanks very much. I'd like to echo uh, Dick Spotswood's comments from the Sunday IJ. Um, there's absolutely no question that MMWD needs a rate increase. In fact, prior to the arrival of Ben and Charlie, I would argue that the financial management of this district was abysmal. And you fell so far behind that now you have to raise rates. You're telling people it's 4% plus a capital maintenance fee. Put them together, it's a 28% increase. This year, 45% over four years. And, and to, uh, again, to, to echo something Dick said about transparency, you're not telling the public that. I think they're entitled to know that. I think that uh, they are entitled to attend a, a rate hearing that isn't two days after Memorial Day weekend, yeah. so that half the people in the county are not here, including one of your directors, who, who is, that's disgraceful. She will be there. I don't care what the, what the business uh, emergency is. I think the capital maintenance fee is way too vague. Charlie made an excellent presentation. But when I look at the financials, I can't differentiate between capital investments and operating expenses. And that's something that has to take place. Uh, and again, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll reiterate what I said about the director's fees. I don't think it's appropriate for the directors to take fees. I think if the directors want compensation because they're missing dinner, that's fine. But beyond that, there should be no compensation. And when you put together, and I hope you will, a committee to work with the board, I hope it has financial people on it and not special interest panels of the board members. Thank you. Next is Kevin Haroff and then Barbara Rothgrew. Well, that's great. Um, 
Thanks very much. Good evening, uh, members of the, uh, of the board. Uh, can you all hear me? Okay, good. Again, my name is uh, Kevin Heroff. I live at 40 Request to Drive in Greenbrae. Uh, and just for the record, my customer number is 406009. <laughs> all of that information was included in my May 4th letter to you all, uh, stating my objections to the rate increase tonight. Uh, I'd like just to briefly read from uh, part of that letter. Uh, and then make a couple of additional comments. Also, I want to mention, although I'm here in my personal capacity, uh, I'm also a member of the Larkspur City Council, and the City Council of Larkspur uh, itself voted to protest this rate increase. I don't want to mention uh, something about that. Uh, from my letter, I'm opposed to the currently proposed increases in water service rates, fees, and charges. The proposed increases have not been adequately explained to the public or justified on the basis of substantial evidence. Among other things, the methodology proposed to assess a new capital maintenance fee, which would be based on meter size as opposed to water use or demand, is arbitrary and inequitable. It should not be adopted. Um, so that's my personal views. Um, I also, from my, with my Seal Arkspur hat on, um, you know, as a member of a governing board, uh, the city council for the city of Arkspur, uh, I completely understand the challenges that public agency uh, face in trying to maintain high quality public services under uh, circumstances of fiscal constraint. So I'm not here tonight to uh, question the overall need for some increased funding to make sure that there is continued levels of services provided uh, by this board. My concerns relate more to the process by which the increase has been justified to the public and the methodology, again, that has been used to determine the proposed capital maintenance fee. My overall concern um, has to do with the basic procedure that has been utilized by this board uh, to allow the increase. Um, essentially, uh, forcing uh, customers to file protests, and, and I think that is a, is a fundamentally non-transparent and anti-democratic way of, uh, of getting these things done. <laughs> And I think the, the information that we heard earlier this evening that only 2% of the customers for the, the water district uh, have in fact knew enough about this to file a protest, um, that to me is unconscionable. Um, there should have been a better process that would have allowed much more uh, substantial public inter inter interaction with this board in the decisions that we're about to take tonight. Uh, and then finally, since I think I may get a little bit more time since I am part of the public agency, um, I just want to note again that the City of Larkspur and the City Council for the City of Larkspur did vote unanimously to file protests uh, to this increase. Uh, the City of Larkspur has, I believe, 52 accounts uh, with the Water District, and earlier this week it filed individual protests for each of those accounts. Um, uh, one question that I have, and I don't know whether this is time for you to answer it, is whether each of those accounts gets a vote. <laughs> or do we only get one vote for the City of Longsburg on behalf of all those 52 different accounts? I certainly hope that it's the latter. That might get our 2% up to maybe 2.5%. Do we have an answer for Mr. Hoff? Yes, each parcel gets a vote. And in terms of Prop 218, the voters of California approved that initiative. It's a voter-approved initiative that approved the process for increasing rates and charges. I, I don't, I'm not here to challenge the legality of your utilizing that process tonight. I am challenging the fundamental fairness and transparency that that process represents. And I think the outcome with the very low level of protests that have been filed with respect to this matter is a clear indication of the fact that this is not a democratic process, whether it's legal or not. Thank you. I just want to make clear that when it comes to Prop 218 uh, and ask our council this question, do we have an option of doing it another way? Property related water uh, fees are processed under Article 13 D6 of the California Constitution, which is Prop 218. We do not have a choice other than what we did. And I, obviously, I think we're talking about ways of doing it better, but. You have a choice now. 
Uh, Barbara. I'm Barbara. Roth I'm Barbara Rothkrug. I live at 158 Mariner and Green Court in Court of Madera. Uh, I've lived there 20 years. I live right under Ring Mountain, uh, which is a big pile of burnt out grass every summer. And I worry about it. I don't want my condominium to be burned up and turned into plastic, toxic plastic, because the water district was not able to increase the rates for vegetation management um, inspections and rangers on the mountain. In the last 25 years, the number of rangers on the mountain have decreased a great deal. And this is a climate emergency. I don't know how people are thinking that raising rates by $4 a month for the average person is a big deal. Um, and the uh, water district also has a vegetation biodiversity management program. Uh, which is important. They don't use pesticides on the mountain. Uh, they need money to fund the people who individually pull out the weeds. I also think it's really important that our water pipes and storage tanks are working and that we have some backup generators in case we need them in a fire. Um, the San Francisco fire, one of the reasons it was such a disaster in the earthquake of 1906 was that all the water mains were broken. So I, tr I trust the water district has made every effort to keep rates low, including floating bonds, which don't make much sense to me. And even after laying off 24 staff in the last 10 years. Um, so I don't object to, the, to raising rates, and I think people who do are pretty short-sighted. Thank you. Next, next two speakers, Linda Novi and then Laura Effel. say something for myself personally, and then something on behalf of <clears throat> Marine Conservation League. So my personal is, I'm a 40-year MMWD customer. I live in Fairfax. I'm a stakeholder. Um, <clears throat> I support your efforts to find a path to a sustainable financial structure and invest and rebuild our infrastructure. I feel like we've been coasting on the shoulders of previous generations. Uh, who made these infrastructures investments and now it's our turn to implement this capital improvement plan that I believe is urgently needed. From the MCL perspective, and I'm speaking now as president of Marine Conservation League, I encourage the board to fully fund the care and maintenance of the watershed. The watershed needs protection, it needs conservation, especially in areas of vegetation management. Since we aren't using pesticides, we need more labor. We know that estimate is high. We need road and trail maintenance, but we need visitor outreach and ranger presence to really make sure we protect the biodiversity of our mountain and keep it, keep it intact. 1.6 million over two years of, a, of an, a, an estimated increase needs a second look, and I believe, and I think our, our organization supports additional funding. The watershed is now considered a capital asset, as it should be, and deserves sufficient funding that meets its needs. Thank you. I live in Larksburg. 
Um, I'd like to say that I, I believe you do need money for capital investment, but this plan is not the right plan. Um, and I've noticed that um, Mr. Hornstein has stopped insulting us by saying, oh, this is a good idea because he's saving us interest. Most of your customers understand that long-term funding of capital needs is a good idea. Because most of us have bought houses. We, under, we usually get a 30-year mortgage or something close. Um, now, when Charlie was showing us some of the things that needed repair, um, one of the shortest-lived items he mentioned was, were the uh, Smith saddle tanks. And he said that the repair of those tanks would extend their lives for 20 or maybe 30 years. Um, replacing some of these 50 miles of pipes, I assume, would extend the life of these, or their new pipes, so they would last, I assume, a lot longer than some of the pipes that are in the ground now. So if these items last for another 30, 40, 50, maybe even 75 years, we shouldn't be paying for them in 10. If I sell my house in 10 years, I've paid for everything that is mentioned in this plan. And the new owners of my house don't have to pay anything for those things. So this is not fair. It should be um, financed in a way that makes sense. And um, thank you. Next is Ann Laser. Oops, sorry. Ann Laser. Next after Ann is Peter Anderson. Hello, board members. Um, um, I have been uh, a member of three uh, citizen advisory committees, uh, rate advisory committees for the uh, water district. Uh, the, first one, the first one in 1993, another one that didn't get a manual, and then the one uh, that uh, ended in uh, 2012. I started attending uh, board meetings in 1990. Um, an, IJ, an IJ reporter attended all the meetings too, and that hasn't been that way for a long time. The district was founded in 1912 made of 26 small private water companies. It results in a design not even a madman would have made. Uh, it has been a great challenge to the district dealing with um, such an unplanned uh, system. It's old. The pipes are 100 years old, pumping water uphill uh, and from our one reservoir to another. The costs are very high. Um, the district owns its watershed, which is actually a great benefit um, in maintaining it, but it is expensive. The district has to work with its history and with its perilous future. I am relieved that the district is looking both backwards and forwards. My wish would be for you to do more that you're proposing at this point, and that you would do it faster. Um, we, all, we all have watched with horror the failure of a utility company that failed to look far enough into the future. Um, and what a lesson for us all that failure has been. You, safety is the most important part of your responsibility. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Peter Anderson and then Charles Ballinger. Peter Anderson from Fairfax. Uh, thank all of you for doing the work you're doing. I don't know how you can do it. Nobody likes rate increases, 
but I support any rate increase that allows MMWD to prepare for the life-threatening effects of climate change. The Paradise Firestorm in Marin is probable and fire readiness demands a significant rate increase. The need is urgent. 85 people, mostly elders, burned to death in their homes or on the narrow, crowded evacuation route leading from the Paradise Firestorm. It is worth noting that well-intended, financially prudent citizens of Paradise organized and stopped a proposed tax increase dedicated to widening and improving the one escape route from Paradise. In hindsight, they and the representatives that supported them could be accused at a minimum of being short-sighted. A friend of mine, a gifted climate scientist, worked for NASA doing research on wind currents and ocean currents. He was assigned to participate in the task of writing a risk analysis report for PG&E several years ago. He identified Paradise and other PG&E sites where their dated and poorly maintained structures and power lines might cause a firestorm when the conditions were right and the wind tunnel features of the terrain could prove to be deadly. The decisions of financially prudent top-level managers eager to please PG&E shareholders by deferring maintenance and critical upgrades led to the worst firestorm in California history because managers had been warned they could be accused of criminal negligence. That will be decided in pending lawsuits. This leads to a few questions re related to budget. How will the recommended elimination of one deputy position affect fire response and ability to direct evacuation of visitors from MMWD in the event of a firestorm? How many rangers with fire trucks are on duty during regular hours? How many employees trained to fight fires are on duty? And what is coverage on weekends, holidays, and after normal working hours for rangers, sheriffs, and employees who are trained to fight fires? When lives are at extreme risk and our cherished watershed is at risk, we need to step up and we need to encourage the board to make the hard, not the popular decisions. It's a matter of life and death because Paradise today, seven months later, resembles a war zone with burnt out foundations and few people. The only people visible might be wearing yellow-orange safety vests, doing toxic waste removal, or cutting down hazard trees. There is still no city water available. No schools are open. Only a few gas stations and food stores escape the inferno that spread at a rate of 80 acres per minute. The soil in many of the burn sites is loaded with toxic materials. Before one can reburn, rebuild, one must decontaminate soils. The town of Paradise is the largest hazardous material site in the state of California. So we need to resolve these important issues brought to us by concerned citizens today and move on to prepare physically and emotionally and financially for the coming firestorm. This will be costly, but to not do this will lead to a catastrophe. Thank you. Charles Ballinger and then Michael Paganini. Charles Ballinger from Strawberry. There's an interesting article in today's IJ about some illegal trails that are part of the funding, I presume, and how they will dispose four and a half thousand cubic yards of silt into our reservoirs. I've been paying the water bills here for 35 years, and during those 35 years, I've wondered how these 60-year-old reservoirs, how much silt is going into them every year, and if there's any expenditures planned for either dredging or increasing the capacity by raising the dams, which I think was last done about 50 years ago. So this is all about spending priorities. The guys will raise the rates, I'm sure, regardless. But I would like to see something that addresses the last question. In the midst of a drought, we're going to have another water shortage, and I really think funds should be directed less towards trail management and more towards water capacity. Thank you. Mr. Ballinger, we do have LIDAR studies uh, of the reservoir capacities. Um, surprisingly, not much sedimentation. Uh, surprisingly more capacity than originally thought. So those studies are available on our website, but I think all those studies have been completed. It's hard to believe because just from this illegal trail, the 40, 40, 
four and a half thousand cubic yards. I call it not a watershed, but a silt shed. I mean, all you have to do is look at water runoff and realize that a lot is going in. And nothing's been done to dredge or increase dams. And the population of Marin has gone up so much in the last 50 years. You know, I'll direct you to something else. And that is a few years ago, we had staff put together a complete book on all the ideas that people have had on increasing water supply. And what that book has is not only what the ideas propose, but what they could potentially cost. And it includes ideas that are way out there, but I think it could be something that could be useful for you because it has information like the question, about the questions that you raise. So just so that everybody knows, a lot of the things that people are bringing up here is actually available to the public um, at our office. And so I would recommend you take a look at that book and see what you might be able to add. I will, but I just hope that in the next 20, 30 years, we do increase our water capacity for reasons of fires and other issues. Thank you very much. So the next speaker is Michael Paganini and then Dean Jones. Board members, I'm Mike Paganini, San Rafael, 50-year water customer from the MNWD with virtually no cavities. So good work on that end. Uh, that'll be my only attempt at levity. Uh, I am opposed to the new capital maintenance fee, as the old song goes that we're all familiar with. Um, the capital maintenance fee is just too damn high. But with that said, I would really like you to explore um, the municipal bond market. One of you mentioned, I don't want to put words in your mouth, because I couldn't see who the speaker was on the board, that you've kind of tapped out the municipal bond market, or that at least you think you've exceeded what you should issue in the municipal bond market. It, you have, sir, Mr. Quintero? No, what we've said is one of the things that we need is an emergency fund and right now, the bond market is does represent our emergency fund should there be a catastrophic fund. Right, but you could also, if you've looked at best water practices, and I'm sure all of you read bond statements from other water districts in California, I've, I've read many of them, and uh, you'll notice that most uh, districts, for future needs, they go to the municipal bond markets. I, I might, before Mr. Quintero, if I could interrupt you, uh, I wrote to you and mentioned about the Yorba Linda Water District about three years ago. Probably all of you are very familiar with that. Your attorney would be familiar with that. There were three uh, board members in Yorba Linda and LA County that wanted an onerous uh, capital improvements tax and an onerous water tax, and I think you know what happened to those board members. They were all recalled and looking for other jobs. They brought in new members, and I'm sad to say that I'm currently an investor in Yerba Linda Water District Board member uh, bonds. They seem to be able to hold rates low. In fact, I've looked at their rates and their capital improvement rates, and I know some of you are laughing at this, but their rates are lower than your rates. Uh, although I do realize they're using groundwater and they are buying water from the Colorado River. Uh, but th these are issues you should really be looking at. Best practices, you go to the bond markets, a uh, 10-year bond, 2.2% with a AAA rating. You currently have a AAA rating. What other, what many other, what I would say progressive bond districts are doing in California, they're going to the capital markets. They're willing to get a slight downgrade, maybe the AA plus or AA, and the, the amount of interest they're paying is infinitesimal because of the low historic interest rates now. Uh, the last comment I want to make is another woman mentioned eloquently that we shouldn't be paying for the uh, people that are going to be ratepayers 60 years from now. It should be amortized over the life of the uh, of this infrastructure. And if um, the uh, uh, the pipes last 60 or 70 years, it should be amortized over those years. Thank you. Dean Jones, and then James Andrews. Good evening, my name is Dean Jones. I'm gonna say that I appreciate the work you all are doing, and I believe all you directors have a letter from me, and I would appreciate you looking at that. Um, two things I'd like to focus on and suggest. One is, if you're not doing so, please coordinate your efforts with CAL FIRE. CAL FIRE and all of your local jurisdiction fire departments, Woodacre Fire, takes care of a lot of our West Marin properties. And place value on the San Geronimo Golf Course as a fire break in West Marin. It is the only fire break we have in Marin County with any significance. Jim Barnes, who was uh, with CAL FIRE for 35 years and was a helicopter pilot, used, and they used for the Mount Barnaby fire that happened last year, 
use the ponds on the golf course to fight the fires because there's no fire suppression systems out there. They had a fire on Thorner Ridge four years ago, three or four years ago, and they used helicopters and bamboo buckets out of the pond on 18 to take care of putting out the fire. It's very important, I think, that you work closely with CAL FIRE and figure out how to make our county more fire safe. Second thing I want to talk about, which is the one-inch meter. I would suggest that you do a research project and find out how many houses have been approved with fire extinguishing fire suppression systems. All of those houses have had to have a one-inch meter by code. It doesn't matter if the fixture units require a one-inch meter. They're required to have a one-inch meter because of, thank you for the response, by the way, um, because of one-inch meter qualifications for fire suppression systems. And if you review that system and you go, you go through the, the, the review results and find that a lot of those homes, and I'm speaking not just for myself now, but for all those people who have fire extinguishers in their homes, they would, I'm sure, end up with less requirements. Thank you very much for your time. Mr. Jones, there, there is a carve-out exception for non-consumption oversized meters in the ordinance. So for those residents that increased their service size for fire suppression, there is a process that they can reduce the capital maintenance fee for because of the non-consumption uh, increase in size. So there is some consideration for that issue. I appreciate that. I appreciate what you said at the onset of the meeting. But I think it's important that you, not only those that are here talking about it, but those who don't talk about it, who are subject to the increased revenue that they pay you because of their increased meter size. Thank you for... There's checking. about 1,300 of them. Yeah. 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 I know it's, it's, it's an onerous task, but I think it should be done. In fairness to your... your, your uh, Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next is James Andrews. And then the next speaker after Mr. Andrews is Ruth Pratt. While we're waiting for those looks, one thing I'll mention is that we're just at the end of a five year study looking at that's being done by. Uh, UC Davis Watershed Sciences Group, CAL FIRE, and others to tell us what the best treatment methods are to reduce the fire danger on Mount Town and in the watershed. And they've been, we can actually direct you to where that work has been done so that you can see the kind of um, experimentation that they're doing. Okay. Mr. Andrews? Okay, we'll wait for him. Uh, Ruth Pratt? After Ms. Pratt is Barbara Solomon. Uh, I'm Ruth Pratt with San Rafael. I sent a letter over a month ago with my protest protestations to the San Rafael City Council with a copy to you. And just to reiterate, first of all, I feel like the rate structure is not fair because it does not include um, renters or those who get their um, water through private fire lines, so the onus is more on the property owner. Um, secondly, uh, the capital uh, maintenance fee uh, should not be funded, and you've heard it from several of the speakers tonight, through pay-as-you-go, but rather through a bond where the costs are structured over time and um, future um, uh, rate payers um, structured so that they pay their, their fair share of it. And also, you should never be putting this capital maintenance fee on our property tax bill. It should be on our water bill. It should be shown as a requirement for your watershed management and your operating costs and everything else. Why did you, that is one change I've seen since I sent my letter uh, over a month ago, why did you allow it to be on the water bill for, until 2021 but thereafter on the property tax bill. Ben, you want to take that one? That's um, That was done largely in response to public comments 
that um, raised concerns about transparency. And um, in discussions at the board, there wanted to be um, assurance that the public well understood what this fee impact would be and would be able to see it in context of their full water bill. So for two years, that would be the case. And at that point, it would migrate over to the property bill, which is at least what's currently in the draft ordinance for the purposes of, that you heard Charlie in his presentation talk about the um, benefit to the property value. Well, I think that's a cop out. I think that you should definitely, it's egregious for you to ever put it on our property tax bill, which is an, in essence, it's in essence a lien, a lien on our property, and as you know, our property tax bills keep going up and up, so I want you to go back to the drawing boards on that. Yes, we understand, we understand what you're doing with the capital maintenance fee, but keep it on our water bill or, or as you go forward. Yeah. Thank, Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, I'm Barbara Solomon, <clears throat> and I'm from Puerto Madera, and I, I sent a letter to the board dated May 9th protesting the water rate increases and the CMF. And we also had a letter to the IJ, a published letter to the editor of the IJ published last Saturday. It was one of three letters opposing your rate increases in CMF. There have been many, many letters and columns in the IJ opposing this, these increases. I've only seen one letter that supported them. That was from your own general manager. <laughs> so, you know, I think that kind of speaks for itself. Um, I'm a former deputy city attorney for the city and county of San Francisco, and I am kind of surprised that you have called this a special meeting for such an important issue. I did a lot of work on Brown Act violations and public meeting law cases, and I think this is it's a pretty clear violation of the public meeting law, and I'm going to follow up on that afterwards. I have my own quibbles with the water rate increases, and I agree under Prop 218, you have the right to reasonably raise our water rates, and I question whether basing the increases on meter size is reasonable. I don't think so. I think you should honor people who have conserved water over these years and continue to do so. So please take that under, under consideration. My main opposition here is that the CMF, calling it a fee does not make it a fee, it is a tax. It is a special local tax. It is subject to a two-thirds majority of vote by the electorate in Marin County. And I urge you, I know you're going to vote and approve this tonight. I strongly urge you not to do so. You're going to make a huge mistake if you do so. You're going to get sued and you are going to lose in court on this issue. So thank you. So can you address the Brown Act uh, issue for tonight's meeting, please? First of all, both lay people and lawyers um, frequently believe they know the ins and outs of very complex areas of the law. Prop 218 is one of them. Um, the CMF, which is proposed tonight, is a property-related fee for water service. It is not a tax. And in terms of the Brown Act, the the regular meetings of the Board of Directors are set at the beginning of the year, and this was not one of their regular meetings. So we are within the Brown Act's um, purview to uh, notice this meeting as a special meeting of the Board. There's no Brown Act violation here. Many of the opponents of the rate increase have bandied that around, and uh, even complaining to the District Attorney that there were potential Brown Act violations here. A complaint was made by uh, an anonymous person uh, that referenced a letter by Mr. Primo, and the district attorney basically found no Brown Act violation. So it's very easy to assert a Brown Act violation 
but it doesn't mean there is one. That's what Jeff decided. Okay. Yes, it is. Uh, next speaker is Barbara Freitas, and then after uh, Ms. Freitas is Karsten Anderson. I particularly loved what uh, Kevin Harrell said about not enough notice to people and why there's such a low response to the pro in protests. I'm a retired graphic designer. I received your four-color brochure announcing your new rate increases and your capital improvement program. At the very last page, buried in a far corner, was how to protest. I don't feel that you made the brochure to notify people of a rate increase. It was basically a nice four color brochure advertising what it is the water district does. Okay, that was my rant. The next thing I have to say is I've lived here since 1985. I'm a senior. I'm taking care of a senior mother. I wanted desperately and have been saving money to add the one time 200 square foot addition to my house so that I would have room for her and for a caregiver. Then I found out that I not only have to pay for that, of course, which I've been saving for, but I'll have to have a new water meter and I'll have to pay a $16,000 repaving of my street fee because I have a 5 8 meter, I have to go up to at least an inch. Um, I'll probably have to have fire sprinklers, but when I called the water district and talked to an engineer there, she couldn't tell me what would happen, what the process was. She said, well, you need to come up with your plans, and after you do that, then you go to a sprinkler company and find out whether or not you'll have to have sprinklers for fire suppression. And no, we can't tell you, but definitely you'll have to have a new meter. So I feel like I've been um, blindsided. It's kind of like the sewer laterals we just had to put in, living in Larkspur for the, for the before street paving. It's like, it's 10,000 here, 16,000 there. It's just really hard as a senior to live in Marin County. And I've lived in the same house since 1985. I think the water rates need to be taken into consideration. I can serve water. I think, I think we need to take another look. And I can tell you, you won't be voted in again. I will try my very best. I really feel that you need to be looking at the people who live here and appreciate us. Carson Anderson and then uh, Susan Kirsch. Hey, I wanted to just speak to the point has come up a couple times on the Prop 218 mailer. Um, there is a lot of information in this. I assure the board and the public that staff did everything possible. Um, well, there's always more we can do in the spirit of continuous improvement, but a tremendous effort with one goal and that is simply to make this understandable. Not just what's being proposed, but the rationale behind it. So yes, there was discussion talking about the work of the district and the needs of the district and where the money would go, but the intent behind it was to make it as clear as possible to those questions to the public. Also, the mailer was designed to attempt to draw attention specifically to the rate protest process. It came as a fold, and on one side of the fold, before it was opened up, was the notice of the public hearing and the description of how to submit a protest. Um, apparently, that was not adequate for everyone and we're taking that information. But I did want to clearly communicate what the intent was in the design of this mailer. 
Thanks, Ben. And just on this Freitas, um, I just wanted to address your um, concern about having to pay for another hookup. And I was looking at our water connection fee study, which was presented to the board last September. And uh, according to that fee study, pending legislation in Senate Bill 831, if passed, would prohibit imposing connection fees on newly constructed detached auxiliary accessory dwelling units. So I don't know how that bill fared. Um, I would think, given public policy promoting ADUs, that it did pass. So that's something I will follow up on and uh, will let you know, okay? So that is a consideration that, that is being uh, looked at by the state legislature. Thank you, uh, Karsten Anderson. I live at 22 Chapel Cove Drive in San Rafael. I've uh, been living in Marin County since 1974, pretty much. Uh, I have a background in finance, and one of my problems with the proposal is the method uh, that the board is proposing. And uh, it also seems to me that the system, as we know, is very old, but it really hasn't changed, so that shouldn't be new news. Uh, what I'm saying is, uh, and I'm paraphrasing uh, President Bragman here when he said, we are trying to get to a sustainable level of maintenance. Well, to me, that means we have deferred maintenance. Uh, the question is, why is there deferred maintenance then? Uh, and I'd like a couple of the members of the board that have been on the board for a very long time uh, to maybe address that in one case over 20 years and the person absent has been on the board for 13 years or so. So I think that's an issue. And the other issue that I've been emphasized a lot of times uh, is this pay go versus uh, uh, a more equitable longer term solution to uh, level out the rates and uh, the fee should in no way shape or form ever be hidden on property tax bills that is just so wrong and I think if you ask every person in Marin County with very few exceptions they would tell you so uh, that is just not where it belongs so, again, uh, thank you for listening, and uh, I hope you take that under consideration. Thank you very much. Ben. I would just like to share a comment regarding um, deferred maintenance. Um, coming into the district fairly recently, I don't look and see deferred maintenance. What I see is that the age of the infrastructure is catching up. And it's tough because a lot of the development was done in, a lot of the infrastructure was done when development happened. So it comes in waves it is, as it ages. And you don't want to replace it prematurely. So there's continuous work to prioritize, but um, from what I have seen, I have not seen deferred maintenance, but I do see a system that's in need of renewal due to its aging infrastructure. And Mr. Anderson, what I, what I actually said was we're trying to get to sustainable financial structure. Uh, and this is not something that's unique to Marine Municipal Water District. This is a national issue of infrastructure replacement. We're kind of at the end of a, really an era of infrastructure and now is the time where we need to deal with it and in a sense that's what we've been trying to do by going towards a more cash dependent type of finance to make sure that we have the revenue to pay for the needed improvements. So that's that's the whole point of this exercise. Uh, next is Susan Kirsch. She's not here. Okay. 
Michael Stevenson, is he here? Hi, Michael. Hi, I'm, uh, I learned a lot tonight. I had things to say, but uh, uh, well, I'll just get some out of the way. I, I agree with the woman that mentioned that there, we need more rangers, not less. There's talk of cutting back, and in fact, we need more. Um, I watch third graders, fourth graders up there pulling non-native plants, and so many people complain about, oh, we ought to get the Conservation Corps or the government to go up there and do it. And these kids are doing this. And, and all the people I've heard complain about doing that. I've never seen them up there doing any volunteer work. So. Um, the rate issue is complicated. I'm just now gathering a lot of information on it. <coughs> but I, I'd like to say that um, I talked to a relative who moved back to Arizona uh, tonight. I talked to them and um, they did laugh at the fact that their water rate is the same as what I pay. I wash your fryer, shower. They had the same thing, the same rate, only they have to cook with bottled water and, and dog food water. It's not potable for people to drink, but they're paying the same rates that what we are here now. So I, I don't mind an increase. Um, how you go about it, I don't know. Uh, that's complicated. I do have a question. Um, San Quentin and, and the Meadow Club Golf Course, have, they're big water users. Do they have a, a different tier that they pay? Anybody answer that? Uh, Meadow Club is a raw water customer, so they are getting charged for untreated water at a rate that I think is called out in the 218 notice. And I believe San Quentin, you know, is a, a bill-paying customer, one of the bigger ones. And, uh, and very interested in trying to uh, move towards conservation and updating their infrastructure and their connections. So. Thank you. Uh, next is Roger Roberts, and then after Roger is Bill, with no last name, that's fine. Good evening, members of the board. Uh, Roger Roberts, I live in San Rafael, and I've lived in Marin since 1970. I support this uh, proposal, uh, and I want to share with the public the fact that you face replacement capital needs on depreciated assets of $801 million. That was a figure that was developed out of an audit that was done last year in connection with uh, a review of your connection rates, connection fees. That figure if you supplement it with what's going to be needed to improve the capital replacement needs and financing for the watershed, you're probably looking at something over a billion dollars worth of investment that's required. You're not only beginning this journey in terms of taking care of your capital replacement needs, you actually are going to need much more investment and I won't be surprised if in your review period two years from now you find that that is really the case and that we'll be seeing increased rates in order to replace your infrastructure, which is important for us in the long term. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Uh, is there Bill? That's you? Okay. My name is Bill Rostenberg. I've been a Marin County ratepayer for 33 years. Uh, I have no doubt that you face an enormous, enormously expensive infrastructure ahead of you. Uh, the reasons these costs have stacked up and your strategies for raising funds, I think, are subject of great debate. Uh, I was glad to see that Richard Harris came to the podium earlier, because as I was thinking how to best articulate my thoughts about this, uh, I discovered that his recent editorial in the Marin IJ more eloquently articulated them than I could. Uh, it's already been mentioned that in the mid-1990s, he was a board member and president of your district. At the risk of being a little bit repetitive, I'm just going to quote some pieces from that editorial. From 2000 to 2007, Marin Municipal Water District Board sought to avoid controversy by raising rates only once, instead using accumulated reserves to subsidize operating expenses. The strategy is part of a pattern of avoiding rate increases prior to board elections, a practice that continues today. The board has failed to accurately assess and anticipate the trend in operating costs and or capital investment requirements, leading to incorrect water rate calculations. In 2017, the board approved a 7% rate increase with a second 7% increase due in 2019, but instead of raising rates by another 7% as planned, the board is seeking substantially more money, a 4% per year, four-year cycle rate increase, plus a new capital maintenance fee. In actuality, when the capital maintenance fee is combined with the 4% rate increase, that Marin Municipal Water District calls the average residential customer, will end up paying 28.2% more in 2020 than in 2019, that's one year. Over the full four years, the increase is closer to 45%. I'm gonna repeat that. We'll end up paying 28.2% more in 2020 than in 2019. Over the full four years, the increase is closer to 45%. There's a lot more I was going to read, but because of time, I'm not going to. It's about the bond issue, which has already been stated. I would like to share some observations about your PowerPoint presentation this evening. And I can only call it a strategic sales pitch, not a, statist a statistical support of your proposal. And my comments are really about transparency and truth. There was one pie chart, oh, it wasn't a pie chart, there was one uh, slide that you already referred to, which talked, if my memory serves me well, talked about 50 miles of new pipe at $1.5 million per mile for a total cost of $98 million. Now, unless the principles of mathematics have changed since I was in grade school, that math just doesn't hold water. <laughs> Uh, is there something I'm missing that's buried in that simple equation where 50 times 1.5 equals 98? And while you're looking for that one, I have another one. Your pie charts, and I mentioned this in your meeting in San Rafael a week or two ago. There's only one slice of pie that I see that talks about any costs related to personnel. And again, if my memory serves me well, that was a slice of something about retirement at 9%. When we raised that question a few weeks ago, you readily admitted that your costs relating to people are above 50%. 50% of your costs are about people. My question is, once again, and at that meeting, another question was asked about oversight. And I believe it was you that said, your response to that was, no, it wasn't you. It was someone else here. Trust us. That was the response. Am I misremembering? About oversight was trust us. 
So my question here tonight is, I, I doubt that anyone's comments at the podium will have much of any impact on the vote that you're about to make, or perhaps on the way to make, I don't know. But my question is, it's a plea. I don't know why you are unable or unwilling to be transparent, quite frankly, to tell the truth. If you did, each of you and all of you collectively could figure out how to be more transparent and truthful. I think you'd see a whole lot more support from your community. Charlie, there is a uh, slide with uh, replace 50 miles of pipe for 96 million under the 10 year capital improvement program. And 1.5 million per mile. <clears throat> Good evening. Uh, my name is Mike Bond, and I'm the manager of the Environmental Engineering Services Division. The 1.5 million per mile number is a present day number, what we pay today. The 96 million is 10 years, but inflated. So yes, in today's dollars, that would be 75 million. But if you inflate it over the next 10 years, it's 96 million. Thanks, Thanks Mike. Ben, go ahead. The, uh, I just wanted to know the pie chart that the gentleman just referenced was modified specifically based on his comment at the workshop to include the pension number that was spread out as salaries are reflective of the areas of the work to be able to show um, where the treatment dollars go, where distribution dollars go. Certainly, everything we do here takes staff, technical staff, engineering staff, um, folks that are in the street, trade crews. So yes, our um, total budget is probably close to half of staff. Our laboratory that analyzes water samples we are a, by nature, this industry is staff intensive. And lastly, um, I did say in response to a question, but for clarity, I said, I'd like at the workshop, I'd like to say as a public servant, trust me, but I know that's not enough. And then I went on to explain the controls we would have in place for this capital maintenance fee. Thanks very much, Ben. Next is Michael Gromick and then Ann Thomas. Good evening, board members. Thank you for your service. Uh, I am here representing a group of about 12 business owners, so I will ask for the five minutes you said those representing a group can get, but I will try to be more brief than that. Uh, about 12 of us own and operate 18 of the self-service laundromats in this jurisdiction as distinct from the two in North Marin. Uh, and I would like to, uh, I want to leave you when I wrap these comments with two, two thoughts. One is that the, uh, the CFM approach with the meter size is going to be regressive and the other is that it's going to be counterproductive to efficiency and conservation. Um, bear in mind that you're not going to get any protests because 16 of those 18 stores are tenant owned and the building owners have standing. So don't expect us to get the building owners to just pass the costs through to us to lodge a protest. Uh, so I think the reason I the request, after you consider these two points I'm making, is to find some way, I don't know how you would do it because the state props apparently prohibit uh, special classifications, but if there is some way to exempt our industry from the approach of basing the CFM on the water meter size, that would prevent these two concerns that I'm going to raise. So the first is, 
why is the CFM approach by water meter size regressive as in its impact? So virtually all laundromat customers are not three quarter million dollar, million dollar homeowners. They mostly live in multifamily residences, be it four unit, two unit, whatever. You know the percentages across the county of tenants versus homeowners. And so those people are mostly dependent on laundromats and most of them are lower income. But frankly, here in Marin, where apartments rent for 3,000 to 4,000 often, they're middle income. And all of those apartments are underserved in ratios of laundry rooms and machines and they come to laundromats. So by virtue of raising the price on water meter size. Remember, our laundromats, by definition, have the larger meters to have the capacity. We're gonna to have to pass those costs on to all the apartment dwellers in the county. Second of the two points is why is it counterproductive to efficiency and, and water conservation and counterproductive to, um, to preservation of the lines, at least in a small way. And the answer is that most of us as operators, certainly our stores, most of us, we have over the years put in highly efficient machinery that compared to what you see, not just for those in homes, but certainly in your fourplexes, your you know, cove apartments where you've got little laundry rooms, they're using top loaders, they're using smaller machines that use disproportionately large. When we get people coming to our stores, they're using high efficiency front load, modern machines that use much less water. We want those people not to be saying, oh my gosh, it's costing so much to go to the laundromat, we're now gonna stop using the laundromats that have machines that use a lower amount of water and go use our 30 gallon top loaders in the little laundry room that's in the apartment. So the water use will actually increase. Uh, and secondarily to that, it's not just that the machines use less water, it's the behavior patterns. I'll wrap up in about 10 seconds, 15 seconds. It's that the machines, if you're paying cash, you put more in. You don't just wash your pair of jeans. Um, if you've got a larger machine, you put more in and so on. So again, this is going to hit when we have to pass these increases on that disproportionately affect us to the meter size. It's going to affect a lower income, middle income people. And so the request is find some way with your lawyers that exempts us from this approach. Thank you. Next is Ann Thomas. Ann Thomas, and then after Ann is Sandra Gouldman. Oh, hi. Uh, Ann Thomas, Port of Madeira. Uh, there's pretty much nothing that hasn't been said tonight, but I did want to um, speak to say that I urge you to approve the rate and capital maintenance fee as described in the Proposition 218 mailer with no modification, um, as modifying it might reduce revenue, which I think you need. Nobody likes to see prices going up. A few people have said that. But the need for increased income, I think, is evident, and Char Charlie and others have gone over it. Um, I've been bombarded by information on this increase. Um, and I think that the fact that there's only been a, really quite a modest written protest, it, despite of all the people that have shown up tonight, the written protests have really been pretty modest to the proposed increase, which should be evidence that the public um, actually gets it. Much as they would like it otherwise, they accept inflation as a fact. <laughs> Okay. Um, much, I, much of your infrastructure has reached an age when it needs repair or replacement. The Ross Reservoir is more than 100 years old. One small earthquake and it's going to be right down the hill in Ross. Uh, mo but one of, uh, one of the things I do want to point out is that along with all of the pipes and pumps you have, 
The district is responsible for almost 22,000 acres of watershed, including most of Mount Tam, which I think a lot of people don't realize, which it currently is suffering from rampant invasive weeds, damaged trails, and an enforcement staff challenged to keep up with the public usage. You know that you, the enforcement staff is half of what it used to be. Add to this the risks and costs of starting to emerge with the new climate, and I think um, at the public, as I said, gets it. Uh, please, uh, with the backlog that Roger just said was a billion dollars, um, and the watershed in shambles, please bite the bullet and just approve the package before you. Thank you. I've been MMWD ratepayer for 50 years. I urge you to pass this rate increase. The watershed is sorely underfunded. Even with this rate increase, it needs more money. Anyone on the board with an environmental conscience should vote to raise fees and in the future raise them more. Also, when people say that uh, this should be bond funded so that people in the future pay for it, sadly, we are playing catch up. We have a very, very old system and we need to address it now. So please enact the, the measure as proposed. And next is L. Smith from Corte Madero. And after her is John Huster or Huster. Lucinda Smith from Puerto Madera. Uh, I too have been a resident of uh, Puerto Madera in this county for 50 years and have seen a lot of increases. Uh, and I know that they have to occur. I'm not so dumb to think that they aren't going to in order to be able to keep up with what the needs are. However, I do have a challenge with the proposal that you're going to be voting on tonight. I stand here and I, I kind of, along with a lot of compatriots here, feel very frustrated because it sounds like you're going to just go ahead and do it, whatever you want to do anyway. Not delay this, not think about it more. You feel you've had these 30 or so meetings of which, unfortunately, I haven't either known of, been aware of, or been interested in, I don't know. But anyway, I think that there's enough protestation here tonight that you need to think about having it um, a little bit delayed and, and possibly rethink it. In, in the paper, um, uh, let's see, it was in the IJ on May 19. There was a question asked that I, I or a, a statement made that I asked a question of why. Coalition of Sensible Taxpayers um, proposed a better plan to fund the MMWD's infrastructure needs with a usage-based capital fee that's fair and legal. The district refuses to seriously consider it. Why? I don't understand why. I don't know what it is, but how it would differ from yours, but I, don't, I would like to know why. If you charge people by the usage, um, that usage is going to vary. And one of the things about is, is dealing with capital management and improvement is you need a budget that you can apply and implement. Certainly during a drought, that usage would go way down and everybody would struggle and have a sudden increase in order to deal with the capital management fee that has to happen in order for that water, even however much water is coming in, for that to be able to flow. And so part of what we need to do is create a stable background that makes sure that regardless of conditions, you turn on your faucet and you get water that's safe and reliable. And, and I can understand that. But let's call it, like they do up in the mountains, a village fee or something. Call it, call it something and put it on our bill. Don't put it on our property tax. I, I think that um, way back in 1970 or whenever Harvest Jail, Howard Jarvis did its passage that it was trying to take care of some of these things that just keep getting added onto the property tax. So please, please rethink that. I will say one other thing too. 
Um, from the comments here, I have um, discerned that you all are elected uh, to your posts. Um, and, and I think that that needs to be something that should not have the pay and the benefits that go along with what uh, you all are receiving. I know that, um, that that's an awful lot of money that might be used for other things in the district. Thank you. Mary, thank you. I, I, I wanted to uh, add to Armando's comment regarding um, meter, using meter size for this fee. And while we are not doing it necessarily because all other water agencies use meter sizes for similar fixed fees, there's a reason why all other agencies, including us, have this practice. And largely the reason, in addition to those earlier comments just made, is that 80 to 90 percent of the costs of this organization are independent of daily usage. When the tap is turned on, the costs that go into that are independent of how much water is used. The costs of the organization are really designed, the operation of the organization, to ensure that water is there when the tap is open. So those are not variable costs. The variable costs in this organization that vary based on usage are relatively small. It's the power costs to transmit the water and some chemical costs at the treatment plant and a few other relatively small costs. But the dominating costs of this organization is unfortunately in, in context of, of this discussion, I suppose, completely independent of how much water someone may use. Someone may not be there all summer, but we are charged and committed to ensure whenever, whenever someone happens to turn on the tap in that residence or business, the safe, reliable water is there. And that is a very significant cost to ensure that. Thank you. I'm uh, John Huster, I live in Corte Madera, and uh, I appreciate the give and take here today that uh, you're willing to have some dialogue with us. Uh, I keep running the numbers and trying to figure out the percentages. Maybe you could answer my question. Are 68% of all the meters 5 eighths at Marin County? 68% of the residential meters, yes. Of all the meters. And then what percent are 1 inch? About 20%. So that would be 88% of all the meters in the county are 5 eighths to 1 inch. and. Everybody below one inch is going to be required to put in fire prevention at some point. Uh, it seems to me that part of the solution would be to combine the five eighths, three quarters, and one inch on the same tier. This separation doesn't make any sense to me. It, the, the, the process you've come up with sounds like more of a corporate solution rather than one that's democratic and for the commons. I, I, I really think that's part of what we're struggling with here is, is this really a quote fair, democratic, commons oriented, you know, like socialism, you know, the commons uh, solution. And, I personally cannot see any difference between you know, the capital expenditure to maintain a 5 eighths meter versus a 1 inch meter. I, I, I hear all this gobbledygook and it just sounds like a bunch of corporate jingoism. You know. So I would encourage you to just 
combine those three as one, and that might help everybody out. Thanks. Thank you very much. The spread and costs based on meter size are based on the amount of demand that increases as a meter goes up. So only a certain amount of water can go through a 5 eighths inch meter. And it's not linear as it goes up, right? The area, the orifice, the opening of the meter and the associated piping. So a one inch meter can draw significantly more water from the system than a five eighths inch meter. And we're using the industry standard calculations on the increase in demand that could be exerted on the system um, with the larger meters as they progress in size. So you understand, just, I'll finish up quickly, thank you. Uh, that's, that's just purely theoretical. In actual <coughs> usage, each home, a 5 eighths meter to a 1 inch meter is going to use the same amount of water. That's in fact what would happen. No one with a 1 inch meter is using more water than some amount of 5 inch meter. Sure they are. Of course they are. No, that's completely wrong. Why? Why is that wrong? Because it's not the facts. The facts are that a one inch meter flows about four times the quantity of water in a five inch meter. It flows meter. more, but it isn't used all the time. How do you know that? Uh, well, how do you know it isn't? Uh, because we keep track of those things. <laughs> well, what, what, when, when a new home is built, I, I could add to that. When a new home is built, um, you pay to connect into the system. And a larger meter pays more. The, there's a reason we have to assume, and it generally holds, that a large home would select an inch and a half meter at a higher cost. Both the connection as well as the monthly cost with the fixed fee than going with a five eighths inch meter. And I'm speaking for those that don't have, and here there's you know relatively few that are upsized for fire protection. So in the, when a designer, an engineer comes to us, or a homeowner, and asks for a meter size, it is up to them ultimately on what meter size. And we have to assume whether it's a home or a business decides to invest in the larger meter, pays for the installation of a larger meter, and pays the monthly fees for a larger meter, that there's expectations that they could pull that demand on the system. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but these are long-term investments. So that's part of the theory why, as an industry, meter size is a reasonable surrogate on potential demand on the system, which does drive infrastructure investment. You know, I can believe you. I stood up on the stage and held out. Except for those of you all you have to do is come to our office. Now, we have a process by which you can get a small But you didn't tell me when I came to your office to do exactly what you said. There's one, you're going to charge me a change out fee for that smaller meter. But you also didn't tell me because I had to get approved by my fire. The, the, the second piece was what? You didn't tell me I had to get approved your form by my fire department. Um, you made it sound like it's something I could come in here and do. It, if you have, we have two processes that one's in place now, but we're going to do a robust job going forward advertising and sharing it with the customers. And that's the approach to downsize the meter. And yes, there is an installation fee, but the payback on doing that in context of the monthly fixed fee, the watershed fee, and this proposed fee, which are all based on meter size, it would likely be a prudent investment to make. And then we have this new process associated with this fee to allow folks to apply for a reduced fee, assuming that 
their meter was upsized for non-consumption purposes, which is namely um, fire sprinklers, and we'll work with folks walking them through that process as well. So one, why did you tell me that 20 years ago? And two, why don't you Um, the next speaker uh, is Paul Primo, and then Nancy Benjamin. Good evening. Paul Primo, I live in Mill Valley. I've been your customer for 55 years. I have spoken to you several times recommending a solution that is fair and that I haven't heard a good answer as to why not. And that is to base the fee on water consumption. It would be $1.65 per CCF, two tenths of a cent a gallon. And I think it's uh, Director Quintero expressed concern that this might not raise the money that you need. It's common practice in the natural gas and electrical industries, when you make a forecast of a revenue component and you don't achieve it, you track the difference in a tracking account and you recover that in subsequent years. So you will get the money that you have forecasted. You will not suffer. So I don't see any reason why you can't consider this. And I've mentioned it to you several times. My increase under your proposal is 45% of my present bill. If you go, as I recommend, to two tenths of a cent a gallon, my increase will be 15%. That's still way above standard cost of living, but it's fair. And a lot of what you've heard tonight are complaints because it isn't fair. And what I propose is fair, and I urge you to reconsider at the earliest possibility. Uh, uh, on the last exchange here, a man was talking about the incredulity of the increase from a 1%, one, a one inch meter versus a five eighths inch meter. Your average customer usage for the one inch meter is 30 CCF. For the five eighths, it's 17 CCF. So the increase is 80%, but you're gonna charge 150% more than that. So again, the inequity of what you're proposing. Finally, and you've heard this too, and I reiterate, use debt to the extent you can after you have appropriate reserves and your coverage ratio is appropriate. What you're proposing is to go from what you say is 100% debt to the extreme of 100% paying this year for the investments you make this year that are long-lived and that are for pipes, tanks, seismic retrofitting, uh, and that have very long lives. It makes no sense. It's another example of your unfairness. And I apologize for running over, but there's so much that needs to be said. Be sure you ring fence the money that you get from the CMF fee. And, and uh, Director Bregman mentioned that. This is crucial. It's fair. It's essential. We'll be watching it. Thank you. Next is Nancy Benjamin and then Ava. Benjamin? Maybe not. You're stuck with Ava. <laughs> Very well. Um, I thank you for making this meeting time available. It was wonderful to hear from different sides. And I want to provide a little perspective 
I just got back from a meeting at Cal Berkeley with environmental activists, uh, young students. And they have a very different perspective on the urgency of infrastructure implementation. Uh, I want to give a little, so it's a little bit of Christmas future. I want to go to Christmas past. My great grandfather was processed through Angel Island before the 1906 quake. He went on to work on the California railroads. Um, my, his daughters worked in the shipyards uh, at Marin Ship with all those wonderful black workers who were, people are talking about inequity, talk about inequity. It's, it's, it's those families who were treated very, very shabbily after the war. Uh, my father, uh, who hated the Vietnam War, was drafted under the Berry Plan. All the doctors could be drafted until the age of 30. And he served. He didn't know of any exemptions. Um, and his daughters uh, have been ardent environmentalists. I'm 51. I have yet to drive a car. Um, we have all tried to make sacrifices um, to make California a better place, not just Monet. This is uh, going to be a statewide effort. It's going to have to be a countrywide effort, and it's going to have to be a national effort. It saddens me. It saddens me greatly to see Mimi Willard at cost take such a narrow view of taxpayer reform. We have trillions of dollars that are offshore. Infrastructure has been starved for decades. And I grew up in the Reagan era. I, the tax cuts there were deadly to infrastructure. This needs to be done. You can't just think of, it, you know, it, it is a generational thing. I mean, you saw the people who came before you, the majority of the people who came before you tonight to complain about the rate increases. I'm sympathetic, but you need to look a little further. So I appreciate your work. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. I, ha I have uh, invited some students to address the MMWD board. These are students that are uh, organizing for the Green New Deal. Uh, to some extent, what we're talking about here is, is or are those infrastructure issues that our country is dealing with. It's a microcosm, but it's, it's consistent with the issue that we need to confront. Next speaker is Nona Dennis. Good evening. Uh, I've been keeping track, and I took this prize for 60 years of drinking your water and paying your bills. Uh, and I have resented it. I have, for me, the 60 years have been a, an enormous education in how the water district works, the value of the watershed to us. It started for me with the drought of 75 to 77, where I first learned about the value of the water and the preciousness of water that we were getting from the water district. From that point on, it was an education in how the district works. I've seen board members come, I've seen them go, I've seen a huge variety, but I've seen actually huge progress. If you think that in 1970, you had one person who was responsible for the watershed, that is as a watershed, as some 18,000 acres on the mountain that are responsible for the water that we get. The infrastructure gets it to us. The staff make it possible for us to have it. But the watershed itself is your most precious capital asset and needs to be cared for. We've seen it ravaged by sudden oak death. We've seen parts of it overcome by invasive weeds. We've seen the recreational use increase by order of magnitude from 100,000 to 2 million a year. That's my focus, the watershed itself and the fact that you simply cannot, cannot let it go. It is your asset, it's our asset. I think of the water district against our water district, not yours, but ours, because we pay for it. Thank you for the work you're doing. I support 
the rate increase. I wonder why my rates have not increased. Oh, in 1959, 60, uh, I'm now paying probably just double what I paid then. Why haven't you increased it more over the years to to show the value of what we're receiving from the world? Thank you. Next speaker is Ed Harkins, and then David Minnick. David Minnick, and uh, I want to raise a number of issues. First of all, you start with the idea that you want a 4% increase in the cost for inflation and other aspects of operations. Inflation has not exceeded 2% for a number of years now, and I think that means you want a 2% minimum increase for just general purposes. I don't think you need to have that much. Second part is that you indicate that the usage of the capital maintenance fee will include a $1 million per year fund to increase fire reduction efforts, okay? Uh, I think people should know how this board addressed an issue that was raised earlier to, in this discussion about the handling of the San Geronimo golf course, okay? And he pointed out all the things that are used for, for pulling water out to help defend fire de defense. He also did not mention but the San Geronimo golf course was paying several hundred thousand dollars a year for their water, to which it suppressed fire. And so when I brought that up to you, because you ultimately decided that you wanted to vote in favor of a sale of the golf course with the use of $2 million of county funds without any discussion. You had no staff report. You had nobody come and discuss these pros and cons of what was going on there. These people have a reason to think there is a transparency here and there. I saw it firsthand because you guys didn't know what you were doing other than speaking somebody happy that you felt with. Mr. Bragman told me that there wasn't any $2 million coming out of the, out of the, the general fund. When obviously, he was wrong when he learned that from the Supervisor Radoni the next time. But let's not forget there's other people in this county besides the very nice wealthy people can stay up till 10 o'clock at night. There's people that live in this county that can't come because they work two jobs or they can't pay for child care. And so the fact that they can't come to a public hearing doesn't mean that they are unable to be unhappy with what you're doing. This is something that's very important for everybody to look at. Businesses cannot raise the prices of their product just because they think they need more money. Okay? They go back and look at what is your core business? What are you supposed to be doing? And you figure out how to fund that, and then if you can do more, great. But you're doing things now that are not your core business. The core business is to deliver the, the water and keep the, co the infrastructure up and going, and that's something you should have been funding all along. It's incompetence not to have provided for that up to this time by setting aside sinking funds, doing parts of, of your financial statements that would have provided additional money, and to try and put it all on everybody now is a demonstration of why we shouldn't have you on this board and the two going forward. Just for clarification, um, the monthly rate is not set at a 4% increase. That's the maximum. The rate increase would be pegged to the actual CPI. Right. The increase in the CMF is pegged to a ENR, which is a construction-based index. The, the 4% what we are showing a 4% increase on the CMF, which is a ceiling for the um, operating budget, it is stated as a 4% per year increase. Okay. okay. Thank you. Once again, I got the numbers right and you didn't. Point, point well taken. <laughs> Next is Mimi Willard. So I think something very unfortunate and divisive has happened as a result of this process. We've, we've been given a false choice that never really had to happen between 
uh, funding our infrastructure and having an unfair plan. And this ends up with members of the community um, all shooting at each other. It's completely unnecessary because uh, the Paul Primo plan produced the same amount of revenue for you, but it produced it in a fair way. Um, and so uh, I think that's just unfortunate and that you still have the opportunity to start over and do it right. Now, the fact that you can do something doesn't mean that it's the right thing to do. Oh, and before I start into that, I just want to mention um, your fire flow fee, I believe, or well, I know, it, was, uh, it went on the ballot. So I don't understand why a capital maintenance fee can't go on the ballot. Um, but uh, going back to what I want to talk about here is um, the fact that you can do something doesn't make it right. You've had repeated complaints about the fact that you don't video your meetings. At some point, you will capitulate on that, and maybe that will be the little bone that gets thrown to people who are unhappy about their capital maintenance fee. Um, we've had completed, repeated complaints about a self-serving board's health insurance. That really should be something that you think about. People don't think it's the right thing in Marin. And it doesn't matter if they do it in Santa Clara or somewhere else. Um, we have board members who repeatedly phone it. Um, so the fact, again, that you can do something doesn't make it right. You had the option to put a protest form in the mailer, but you didn't. Um, instead, we had a full board at a communications committee meeting that designed a mailer to sell the rate hike by highlighting a $163 CMF as the average customer. It's not. It's the average of the, of the smallest meters. So instead, we have a highly unpopular fee structure that people think is illogical. Um, and the height of this illogicalness is that you've got 12,000 customers who have a one to one and a half inch meter that don't have sprinklers on them, and they will end up paying more than the people who have one inch to one and a half inch meters who do have sprinklers. Doesn't make any sense. Um, so uh, uh, I, I just think that uh, it's the responsibility of the board to not simply protect the water district and a particular plan that has got too much inertia behind it, but uh, instead the appropriate thing is to think about the fact that you have a broader constituency, some of whom are going to be really hurt by a plan that isn't fairly distributed across the various constituencies. Thank you. Thanks, Mimi. Next is Pat Magali and then Mariette Shin. Hello again. Um, my name is Pat Magali, and I've um, been here before. I'm really concerned about the fairness of this new proposal. I was here two years ago, and I brought it up then, and now I'm really bringing it up. And I've been to a lot of rate hearings and council meetings and things like that, usually as a spectator. This is the only time I've ever been angry enough to actually get up and speak, because I don't like to do this. Uh, this is really grossly unfair. And I do want you guys, I implore you to go back to the drawing board and rethink it. Because I agree with everything that everybody said that's protesting so far, so I'm not going to reiterate. But what I did promise to do is show you what a proper prop 218 notification looks like, and you're welcome to look at it. Um, it doesn't have a bunch of fancy pictures, uh, doesn't say how great they are, it just explains, gives you all the nuts and bolts, all the numbers right here, tells you the reason why they're increasing, this is like a 2% increase, and even for a 2% increase, they included a ballot, so people could just tear this off and mail it back with their water bill. You guys didn't do that. This is a, a standalone Prop 218 pamphlet. When people get this in the mail, they know what it is. The thing you guys sent out it was this. It was basically, you know, I'm, I'm sure you guys do a great job, and I'm not trying to degrade you. I know you have a great uh, system, some wonderful employees, but this is all about how wonderful you are. And it doesn't say anything about Prop 218 on here. Nobody would know. And I will tell you, from the people I've spoken to, there's a lot of folks that didn't even know there was a rate increase. 
because it's buried in here. You have to read the whole thing, and then you can't find out that there's a way to protest it until you get to the very back page. And here it is, little tiny corner of the pamphlet. So I didn't think that was very fair. I think it's unethical the way you did it. Whether it was intentional or not, I don't know. But I do know that if you read about the Prop 218 um, statute, it does say, let's I'll read this, the cost imposed on each property owner must be proportional to that property owner's water use. This clearly is not. The provider must base the rate increase on actual use, not estimated use, or potential future use, or of course, what size water meter you have. So I just think there's, I think you guys need to go back and rethink what you're doing, okay? That's all I have to say. Thank you. Can we, can we get a copy? Can we? Get a copy of that? I can make a copy. And I also have a bunch of water bills that are from all over California. If you would it's send that much in. Much lower, and I will send those to you. Send it in. Thanks. Next is Mariette. Hi, I'm Mariette Shin, and I'm an employee here at the Water District um, in Information Systems. And I've been with the district for 18 years. And I just want to say we have 200 now, about 240 employees who are responsible for taking care of this very complex water district system, complex topography, complex infrastructure, and piping for the oldest water district in California, and take care of this 21,000, 22,000 acre watershed. Um, you know, and be very responsive so that I've heard a lot of compliments about, you know, the support for employees, but uh, just so you're aware, you know, we are recognizing that we can't do more with less. We personally see the um, need day, day by day on a daily basis for the need for a rate increase. We see the failing infrastructure when, when we go to repair leaks. We see the increases in paving costs and the complexity of trying to uh, coordinate with cities rising you know, costs for paving and other uh, licensing, other certification requirements, trying to coordinate with um, you know, even their street cleaning. You know, I mean, we have a a lot of emergency responses that uh, for leak repairs that we cannot completely account for or predict. So um, our crews are extremely reliable, super hardworking. I'm proud to work with my my peers who are sitting back there in the in the back, um, and we daily discuss how we need to address the aging infrastructure concerns because it cost a million dollars to replace one mile of pipe. Last year we only replaced 70 miles of pipe. Think about how many years it's going to take. We have, um, as Charlie pointed out, almost 500 miles of pipe that's over five, or over 50 years old. And this is, it should be a concern for everybody and it's not, we can't just keep accruing more bond debt because it's not going to be healthy for the district to, and for our customers to keep supporting that method to infinity. Um, so what the board is trying to do and what I think the employees see the, the board is trying to do is to address this urgent, these urgent requirements where we do not have the funding uh, we need right now. Like for example, Ross Reservoir is extremely critical and if you go take a look at the pictures or you go visit the watershed and you can see it for yourself, it's, the need is urgent but the cost is great and we, we need to have the funds and we can't just keep asking uh, the district to accrue more and more bond debt. Um, you want us to expand the watershed resources. You want us to um, enlarge the capacity of water we have, and yet you want us to reduce our rates or not increase our rates and reduce our staff. Um, we can't keep making cuts. We have to face the realities of uh, increasing costs to the water district, inflation. Um, and another thing I want to address is Oh, okay. Can I just say one more thing? Okay. All right. Okay. Next is Chris Turnham. Chris and then Mark Converse is 
on deck. All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Chris Turnham. I am a MMWD employee and on the Union Steward Council. When I hear people start talking about our pensions and how big our salaries are, I want to be known that I was born and raised in Fairfax. I've attended Manor Elementary, White Hill Middle School, and Sir Francis Drake High School. I went on to Sonoma State. I'm a definition of a local. And I can't afford to live in this community anymore. Last board meeting I attended, I didn't get home until 11.30 at night. In order for me to be on time at work, I get up at 4 a.m. every day. If I had the amount of money that some people claim that I make, you bet I'll be living back in Marin County. But I don't, and I'm not here. I'm just one of the many employees that cannot live within the MMWD service area. We don't have inflated salaries. We don't have outrageous pensions. I just read water meters. I read and repair water meters. My coworkers are always out there maintaining our infrastructure and fixing it when it breaks. Their lives are interrupted so yours can be on schedule and on time. We need this revenue so we can do our jobs and provide this great service to our community. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chris. Mark Converse and then Aaron Burton. Hi, my name is Mark Converse and um, I live in Ross and by background I am a uh, civil engineer and in the early part of my career I worked for a, a construction company that built and maintained uh, water utility systems and then for a while I also worked for uh, one of the preeminent civil engineering consulting firms in the area. Um, as I look at the, de the information that's been presented, um, it's, it's really hard to find out really what's going on. I, I agree with a lot of what's been said about the lack of transparency. Um, and by my background, I actually know what it costs to run a water system and fix a lot of the stuff. I've done that. I've been up all night fixing pumps in my previous part of my life uh, to get water back to people. So I know what it takes. And you guys are essentially a 240-person construction services company, engineering services firm. And, and the challenge I think we've, we're facing here is, and I certainly understand um, the idea of deferred maintenance or deferred construction. I certainly understand that. I understand the physics of that and the engineering quite well. But I think the challenge you have is the cost problem, as some folks have said. And the previous gentleman talked about um, the wages. I mean, I couldn't find out what percentage of, of your of your cost structure that is. It's really hard to find that out and figure that out. And so my question is, is, is how come it's not presented in a way that's transparent and easy to see how that's changed over time? I went back and looked at a number of your old budgets, and it seems to me you've changed the way you've accrued for those and account for those, so it's kind of hard to figure out what those are now versus 15 or 20 years ago, but they've clearly gone up, and they're clearly going to go up more. And so my question is, is, is there's 240 employees and I think a couple hundred retirees that are serving you know, the public here of 250,000 employees, give or take. How does it, I mean, why is it fair that the rights of those folks supersede the rights of all the ratepayers in terms of wages and benefits that, by the way, we can't get? So uh, I just, it's not that clear, and I would urge when you, you know, put those documents out in the future, you're more upfront in terms of how that's impacting the cost, because essentially your costs are, because of those things are, you know, some percentage out of line in terms of what it really costs to run the uh, water system. So I oppose the rates, and I think if you know, I, I, you know, it's 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 expensive to live here. Well, I get that, and I don't have a problem anybody making a lot of money if the wages are set by the market, and you know, unfortunately they're really not, because if you want to. If you want to raise, if you want to, you know, get some more costs, you just pass on the ratepayers and do what you want. It's never really not fair. I think that's why a lot of people have been are upset. So I oppose it rates, but um, I hope we can do this differently next time. I've been the chairman of the California Water Commission for three years, and I've been on the Water Commission for five. And I travel all over California holding public meetings, looking at different water systems, looking at state water projects and all of that. And one of the things that we always look at are rates and wages. And one of the things that happens, and I've seen it happen in a number of areas, that when you, and you, I mean, if you run a construction company, you know this. If you don't pay enough, you become a training center. And, and I can tell you that the wages that we pay here are right in line with 
pretty much the industry standard. So if we don't keep our wages at where they are, we will become a training center. Like I said, I'm, I'm not opposed to making people make a lot of money. The problem is if you want to hire 10 more people, you just charge us. Or 20 more people, you just charge us. Whereas if we normally hire 10 more people, you just charge us. Whereas if a normal company, your customers, they can't do that. And that's just not really fair. Okay. You run out of business. You got like that. Okay. Uh, Aaron Burton, and then, <clears throat> and then Lorna Chris, and Steve Lang. So I just want all of the rank and file staff to stand up and raise your hand. So all these people, can we please give them a round of applause? So 80% of my members cannot afford to be the neighbors of many of the folks in this room. We have to commute. Many of them commute many hours, a round trip a day. And many would actually classify as poverty. Uh, and so one thing I also want to remember also is that a lot of our staff, actually most of our staff, have various certificates, have various degrees, are highly skilled, and this is very complicated. I, uh, you know, when I, I went to Cal Poly Pomona, even though my, my degree was in political science, but I was, um, I did uh, model UN, and one of the uh, internships I got to do was on Waddle, particularly uh, in the international community, and you really realized how challenging Waddle is in our society and in the rest of the world, but also here in the United States. And we have, to, we have to address those challenges. We have to make sure we have the funding to address those challenges, and we want to make sure we have the talent here. Um, because I have seen firsthand the cost of uh, having perpetual turnover of staff when employers were trying to be penny-wise pound foolish. Um, and I just want to say that um, uh, I, I think that we need to make sure that our members have the resources to do their jobs. We have have had less rangers. We have had less staff. They've been asked to do more with less. We want to make sure that we, if we all contribute to this, we all have, um, you know, we all have uh, the resources needed to do our work. So thank you so much for your time. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Lorna Chris and then Steve Lang. Uh, sorry, Dan, uh, Don Driscoll. Yes, thank you. It's clear that people were not satisfied with the Prop 218 procedure that was used here. And it's clear that people want to be allowed to vote on whether there's a rate increase. When the issue came up, the board asked Mary Casey what the situation was, whether a vote was possible. And she told the board that Article 13D of the California Constitution applies. That's correct. That's Prop 218. And that describes the procedure of using protests. And the board heard Ms. Casey to be saying a vote couldn't be taken. But that isn't what Ms. Casey said. When I listen to a lawyer, I listen as carefully to what she does not say as to what she does say. And she did not say that a vote could not be taken in addition to using the Prop 218 procedure. So I challenge her right now to offer an opinion that a vote could not be taken. Director Bragman, would you like me to respond? Please, please do. <clears throat> So first of all, uh, the board of directors of any public agency has discretion about how to go about um, uh, setting rates. In the water industry, I have uh, long experienced that the norm is that the protest procedures under Prop 218 are followed. I think it would be rare for a water agency to um, uh, put a, uh, a property-related water fee to a vote. Taxes are put to votes. Assessment district fees are put to votes. And water fees 
were just in, I think it was early, the early 2000s that the Bighorn Desert case determined that water-related fees were subject to 218. So do, does the board have discretion? Yes. Is it the norm? No. Okay. So as Ms. Casey has now said, the board misunderstood what Ms. Casey said, and in fact, a vote is permitted. Thank you. Excuse me, but I don't think you should speak for what the board understood. What I said was that the process for, the normal process for um, adopting water rates is via Article 13 D6, which is the protest procedures that were enacted by the voters of this state. Anybody can go back and watch the audio, watch the videotape or the audio tape and see what yes. transpired. Thank For you. the record, okay. I did not misunderstand what you said. Uh, it was Mr. Quintero who, who asserted that a vote was not, could not be taken. And I'll let, the, uh, there's no point in arguing about it. It's been recorded. Okay. Thank you very much for your comment. Let me take a quick bathroom. Hold on. So you know, Steve Wang, you called me up earlier. Your name? Steve Wang. Yes. Yes. So, hi. Um, I'm uh, Steve Lang. I live in Mill Valley. I've been there for 24 years. So I guess I'm a relative short timer compared to a lot of the speakers here tonight. But um, and I had uh, I had met Ben and Charlie uh, earlier this year and talked a little bit about my background. Is I've been uh, for 30 years. I've been an institutional muni bond investor. And so I've, I've worked for a number of banks and investment banks, and uh, I've been, most recently, I, I, I actually have my own uh, muni bond, California muni municipal bond fund. So I'm very aware of MMWD's reputation in the market and its credit rating. And so er earlier in the year, I sat down with Ben and Charlie, and you know, sort of was encouraging them to, you know, to look at debt financing. And they both explained clearly the uh, kind of the path that you guys were going down to try to shift more towards fee fees as opposed to continued debt financing. But even since when we first sat down, the muni market has been going, just rallying like crazy these last couple months. And, you know, I just took a look at where your bonds are trading right like today the most recent deal you guys did which was two years ago the 2017 deal which was a subordinated debt deal so it's actually the slightly lower credit rating of your credit and the demand for that the 30-year bonds on that deal uh, were priced at just below a three percent and then those bonds today are trading through a 230, so they've they've actually rallied 70 basis points from where, and you guys got great execution on the subordinated debt two years ago, really through a 3%, because the prior year deal, when you had a higher credit rating, like you were, I think, three and a quarter or something like that. So, you know, so the point is, today, you could do 30-year debt at, uh, probably just through a 230, and you could do 20-year debt probably at about a 210. And so realistically, that's subordinated debt that I'm sort of talking about. So that would give you the ability to really continue debt financing, really. And I just would encourage you to, to reconsider just giving the, the rally that we're facing right now and your ability to do more subordinated debt. I, I mean, there's no dispute that the infrastructure needs funding. And it seems like even if you, if you have reservations about the interest expense of 30-year debt, if you just looked at 20-year debt, like you said, at a, at a 210, that should be you should seriously consider that because it would very logically fit the term structure of the infrastructure needs that you have. And it seems like as long as the market is giving you this opportunity for cheap debt financing, I would encourage you to consider sort of maximizing what you can do within the confines of your proper coverage ratios. 
but I, I would just, again, just ask you to reconsider. Thank you very much. Um, folks, we're going to take about a five-minute break, and we'll be back, okay? The meeting, and uh, we still have a few more speakers. We got everybody. Okay, we're going to call the meeting back to order, please. <laughs> okay, the next speaker is. Karen Horstmeyer. Karen Horstmeyer. You want me to wait? <laughs> okay. Well, first of all, I think that in hearing the um, Marin Municipal Water District employee come up, or a couple of them, I really just want to say I think that we really do respect and appreciate the hard work that they do and know that any time money is involved, uh, you know, I think for taxpayers and such, it, it becomes a difficult situation. With that said, um, I have a few concerns to share, and I would urge you to vote against the um, proposal as is, um, and I think, I would hope I'd speak for um, most uh, water district payees or whatever, that a slight increase or an increase is understandable, but not a capital management fee on our taxes. And here are my concerns, a couple of things. One, money management. It seems planning for the future should have been included in our fees over the years, which I'm sure part of it has been, but at the same time, any time we have a drought, we try and save money, and then our rates go up. And then we have tons of rain, and we got to use, you know, want us to use more water, and then our rates go up. Understanding those rates, but to put it on our taxes, I think is just really over the top. And that's one reason why I would urge you to reconsider that. Um, you're asking us to pay a capital management fee tax. However, I haven't heard about a reduction in compensation by the board who is receiving a shocking dollar amount and benefits uh, for a few meetings a year. It's almost 100 meetings. Oh, 100 meetings. Somebody had told me five meetings. So if that is... Okay, then I stand corrected, and that would be much better, okay? Um, the, the next thing is uh, that I think we don't need any scare tax t tactics saying that we're not going to have good quality water. We want to maintain our quality of water, because I would guess that would be the first priority. Um, and then in the newspaper today, somebody already addressed that, but to restore trails and make, you know, easier for mountain bikers to get from one place to another, that concerns me about where our dollars are being spent. So, understand a rate increase. Personally, I don't have a problem with that. I have a big problem with that going on our taxes. And just one last thing, and I'll get off here, is that we have elderly in this community, we have middle class in this community, and the amount of taxes and, and asking more and more taxes and from a water department, you know, along with everything else, is making it unaffordable for those people to stay and live here. And, you know, I think that that is why I would urge you to reconsider the way this is structured. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, is Laura uh, Ethel or Ethel here? She left. Just one thing about the trail article, that is unfunded. That trail improvement project is not funded. We, we are going to be... 
we are going to be looking for funding to actually build that trail for grant funding or for grant funding similar. yeah so is not here. Priscilla Bull is here, I think. Good evening. Um, I think uh, speaking to you board members, you have heard me enough. That can't hear me there? Okay, I have to get up close. Well, we know. I, I, uh, I have felt that this measure was insufficient for our needs, but it is what we have, and so I hope you will uh, approve it tonight and move ahead quickly, because uh, e e the, the needs are urgent, and that we'll start over again and get more next time. I do find I had talked to uh, an acquaintance who is in the insurance industry, and he assures me that the, and you probably all know this, but that the insurance industry as a whole is really looking at this whole problem with fires and that they are um, going to be looking at giving rebates of some sort to people who have fire sprinklers. And he couldn't obviously tell me what they would be because it would depend on the individual property and what its other aspects are. But I think people who are concerned about paying a little bit more for their larger pipes may be getting uh, some relief, if not in, even a benefit, because of the fire protection the sprinklers and the one-inch pipes do. I don't know about the laundromats. That was something I hadn't thought of. But, <laughs> but the, uh, the fire sprinklers and uh, the, the larger amount of water is going to be addressed in the insurance industry. I must say it's ironic to me that the people here who are obviously very um, concerned about taxes and costs, which I sympathize with. However, Prop, thir Prop 218 is the son of Prop 13 and was cheered by the harvest Jarvis Taxpayers Association, and they're the one that set up this interesting process for uh, uh, imposing fees. So if somebody thinks that the Prop 218 notice and requirements isn't um, fair, they should contact the Howard Jarvis people. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, uh, Barbara Salzman, and then Robert Malloy, and then Larry Minikis is our last speaker. Gee, <laughs> we're coming to an end. Um, I'm uh, representing myself as well as Marin Audubon Society, and first like to say a few words for Marin Audubon. We, our board discussed this. Uh, we support the measure, except that we would like it to be more funding, and you've heard that from others. Uh, we're very concerned about the status condition of the watershed, uh, the, uh, being overtaken by broom and other things, other non-natives. Um, I don't expect you to change things, uh, but um, in the future, as Priscilla just said, you should look at greater funding for the watershed. Uh, secondly, for myself, I've lived here over 50 years. That seems to be the figure of the day or the night. Uh, and I'd like to make a few points about the meeting tonight. One is that I don't think that Whatever you did, you would still have complainers today. You would still have people who wanted to have other other approaches, or and maybe some of the ideas are good, but but basically this is where you are, you know. And so you have to you have to vote for this. And um, with regard to water, I frankly can't think of any more important reason to 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 support this measure because we need to continue to have the good water that you have and provide to us in the district um, uh, it, it's people choose to spend their money in lots of different ways they go and some go on trips some buy big houses some do other things um, but water is an essential thing for all of us and i think people sometimes lose sight of that and so i just urge you to uh, vote for this tonight, and uh, otherwise you would not be being responsible to to your the broad um, um, 
customers. Thanks. Thank you very much. Next is uh, it's Roberta Malloy. Sorry about that. Roberta, going once. Okay. Then last speaker is Larry Minicus. <laughs> Sounds like I got a fan out there. <laughs> Good evening, board. Um, you, you already know where I stand. I, I hope that we'll pass this tonight without modification. It's, it's badly needed. But what I'd really like to address is some of the people in the room who really don't understand how we even got here. And we've been pointing a lot of fingers tonight, but the fingers we need to point are at ourselves. Because for 29 years, out of those 29 years, 15 of those years we didn't raise rates. And that's because the same people that only come to these rate meetings, I don't see, that I've been coming to meetings, I've been working with this board and working with an MWD for 27 years. And I've seen what goes on. We have dedicated staff that are back there that are still here at this hour. Need to understand these people are committed and to listen to some of these people it just makes me sad. What, what you need to understand is rates were frozen. Um, Richard Harris he, he was wagging his finger, yet he is the one in 1994, that's when rates stopped raising from 94, really through, um, for about 10 years. And I wrote in 94 and I wrote in 98, and I spoke to the board several times, and I said, you have to raise rates. You're kicking the can down the road, and the day is going to come when we're going to see very expensive upgrades, and we're going to have to pay for it. And guess what? Here we are. And last, the last rate hearings, when we wanted to see a 7% increase, it got knocked down to 4%. That's a 43% reduction in income. You've got to understand, it's not just 7 to 4, it's 43%. That's kind of why we're sitting here today, why we're standing here today, is because of that. You know, I keep hearing about fairness. Well, when the fire comes, and you can talk to any of the fire chiefs. Any fire professional will tell you it's a matter of not if, but when. Where, and, and your community, bah, Larkspur, okay, they voted against this. When Larkspur goes up in flames, where do you think they're going to point their fingers? They're going to point the fingers at this board for not doing enough. And the only way, oh, excuse me, sir, I'm talking. And the only way, the only way we're going to get this done is by paying for it ourselves. It's not, we can't go out there. The, the bonding guy, I know nothing about bonds, but what I do know is that there's a disaster coming and we need to hold that back so that we, can, we will ha have the ability to get bonds once the disaster arrives because we've seen it, we've seen Napa, we've seen Sonoma, we've seen Mendocino, Redding, Paradise, climate change, it's coming. We have to have situational awareness, and that's what I've been talking to this board about, situ situational awareness. What is actually happening beyond this room? You know, and the last thing I want to say, because it is very late, is 2.5% of us have protested this. That means that 97.5% either completely agree because they want our leadership to do something. No. Uh, sir. No. Or... You have your nerve. You know, you really have some nerve. Excuse me. <laughs> Not, it's late and I'm tired. Either. See, this is what happens when what people try to do is shut you down when they don't want to hear what you have to say. But when they speak, we're all quiet. Hypocrites. What I would like to finish, because I'm being interrupted, what I'd like to say is there are three classes here. People who are against this, they were motivated. You're, you're sitting here still. Then there's people that want this, there's people that really don't care, and there's people that just didn't bother. But even if we made it easy, I can assure you, without a doubt, we would, this would have passed well beyond 50%. Thank you, good evening. Okay, that uh, brings uh, public comment. We'll close the hearing and uh, bring it back to the board for discussion and consideration. So.
I guess I'll start. Um, I, I think I think uh, the board, my colleagues on the board know. You know, I've had some reservations about the current um, state of the um, fee proposal, but the majority of the board made a decision, directed um, a drafting of the current ordinance, and here we are. So it is a binary decision that we're facing tonight, up or down. Um, some of my concerns, I think, have been addressed. Um, adding a two-year review, um, I think, is a great idea for everybody. It, it kind of gives everybody uh, a little bit of reassurance mm -hmm. that we're going to be watching this closely. I'm concerned about what effect this is going to have on water consumption because it could affect water consumption. What effect is this going to have on um, shutoffs? I don't really think we have a lot of shutoffs, but we definitely recognize that water is a human right. I think all of us on the board understand water is a human right. We are a public agency. We are responsible to you. And we take that responsibility seriously. So I think it, it bears that out that the board is willing to take another look at this in two years instead of four years so that we can track the impact and really see how this plays out. The other two issues, um, segregating accounting of the revenue. That is something the board has agreed to do. That's something the community wants and deserves. That's going to be done. And the third issue for me that remains sort of in play is how we're going to deal with our sister public agencies. So some of our biggest customers are actually other public agencies. It's not just residential customers. We have schools. We have municipalities. We have other utilities. These are big water users. These are big customers of ours. And we need to make sure that these other agencies that provide, also provide vital public services are not unduly impacted or even harmed by this proposal. And so what the board has discussed and considered is to do a really active reach out to all the public agencies to help them audit their water use and reduce water use and reduce the size of some of their services so that they can garner savings to reduce the impact of the fee. So those are three changes, three improvements that the board is agreeable to, to doing to improve the proposal and to reduce the impacts and to make sure that we just don't go off half-cocked. We're going to be continuing to monitor the situation as we go forward. Um, and I think that's a reflection, really, of the work that's been done by the community coming in and expressing their reservations and their concerns about the situation. So it has been an imperfect process. I can tell you after 15 years, uh, both municipal and utility board experience, there aren't many processes that aren't. Uh, every time we did a proposal, a fee or a tax proposal, in the town of Fairfax, it's the same thing. As the deadline draws near, more and more people are coming to our meetings and, and expressing their concerns. So it's a hard thing. I think we can improve that by webcasting our meetings. And the board will be considering that in the coming months. So these are all improvements I hope we can provide to the community. I think. The more the community knows and understands about the water district, it's going to benefit the community. It's going to benefit the water district. We need to improve 
our community engagement. And I think there's a recognition of that by this board. So I'm heartened by that. Nothing's 100%, but it's working together to improve the situation, to work together, to meet the needs of the community. This is your district. We've been elected to represent you. We also have sort of an institutional loyalty. This is a historic institution. It's the first public water agency in California. I think we all recognize the work, the dedication, and the skill that's needed to run this organization and to keep this institution going. So to some extent, there is a bit of divided loyalty, a bit of <coughs> conflict. And we, we do our best to reconcile it when we make these decisions. So... Um, Was there the, any purpose in our coming here at all tonight? Yeah. Those who are dissident, is there any reason we were here? Any reason at all? I think there was. For what? Why doesn't he have to obey the rules? <laughs> he, he should. You're out of order. Uh, we can talk after the meeting. But I, I think it is a process, and it's a public process. It's, uh, you know, you're, I, I don't mean to say you're too late. I think your comments have been heard. And, you know, you got to kind of stick with it. You can't just abandon the process. So... You've been you've been heard. I, I'm going to pass. I'm going to pass the uh, uh, baton to some of my other board members. Uh, I first of all, I want to say that uh, this. I've been through a lot of rate hearings. Uh, this rate hearing has absolutely nothing to do with pensions and salaries. That's a fact. Now you can argue against that, but that's the fact. What it has to do with is. Uh, our 22,000 acre watershed, Mount Tamalpais, uh, and the infrastructure, continuing infrastructure, uh, not, not making up for lost time. It's a continuous process, and we're changing how we do it uh, to a certain extent, but it's to maintain that continuous process, maintain the mountain in the face of climate change and uh, increased wildfires, increased knowledge of wildfires, all of which is absolutely critical, and if I'm going to live with myself, i got to vote for it now. Now, why did you all folks attend the meeting? Well, I heard a lot of very compelling arguments as to why this is unfair uh, and why it's not a good thing. Some of them, quite frankly, uh, I'll uh, dismiss as nonsense. Others of them I took quite serious uh, and were compelling. And I will consider them, and I will, uh, I, and, and I'm sure our staff. This is the first time we're doing this restructured uh, uh, method of collecting the tax. It's obviously less than perfect. If I learn nothing out of this meeting, I learned it's less than perfect. Uh, it's it will change over time as we get a little bit better at it, as we learn things, as our staff works on some of the glitches that you've identified right here tonight, uh, and uh, the the. At, at, and I'll support Larry's uh, a, a shortened uh, check-in and other changes. The other three, the three items that you suggested that we need to consider, I think that's on board. I'm a thousand percent with that, and other changes that I'm sure our staff will make in the process too. So we'll get. I'm sure still not a perfect process, but at least it will be better. Uh, so bottom line is, yeah, we heard you. Uh, you didn't waste your time coming here. Uh, what will come out of it, we'll have to see. We're, we're learning as we go. But with all of that said, I don't want to kick the can down the road. I intend to vote for the, the product we have now and then work on making it better. <clears throat> um, you know, it was really good that everybody came. I listened to what everybody was saying. I took a bunch of notes. I took down some names because I want to see what they're thinking in terms of how we might move forward as we work on these projects because it's going to be continuing, you know, we've heard continual improvement, but I'm sincerely interested in that. There was a gentleman in the audience who asked me, who am I and why am I doing this? And who are we and why are we doing this? And just in a quick nutshell, I was a national park ranger for over 20 years. I worked as an educator in the, in the Marin area, 
teaching science, Spanish, and art for 10 years. And for the last 11 years, I've been executive director of the Sierra Nevada Research uh, Institute for the University of California. And I work with the top watershed, water, soil, and air scientists in the West. The people that I work with are the people that you see quoted everywhere. And the people that I work with there, I've brought to the district to our meetings to advise us on how we should look ahead to the mountain and my greatest concern is the health in fact I look at this picture that you guys are all looking at of the uh, Murray Municipal Water District I think in the future we should have a split and on one side you should see the historic picture of that view and on the other see what we see today because as many places throughout the US and throughout the West this place is overgrown and it's it is literally an explosion waiting to happen and my concerns about the investments that we have to make have everything to do with a single devastating fire up there could actually damage the water quality to a point that this community would be in crisis and our you know people would be a, you know you'd have life and property threatened but literally we could lose the water quality that we have in a one-day event um, I really recommend that you take a look at the Marin history project they have a video that shows all of the historic fires that have occurred in Marin and it's it don't turn off the soundtrack because it's bonanza in the back but what it does is it shows literally a map of Marin burning up and there's one fire and I forget the years year when it happened but it started over in Dogtown burned up over the ridge burned down through everything that is Kent Lake all the way to Fairfax 1945 okay Okay, that's the, I won't forget that. But I really recommend that everybody take a look at that and think about where we are today and what it's going to, and I don't know what we're going to have to do. In fact, we just are finishing a study now to see how we approach this. We've got the BIFIP out. And all of those things add up to a real serious concern that we're going to have to address. And we may have to bring, we're going to have to bring everything to bear on this. Um, and, uh, I, also, I mean, I also said that I'm the chairman of the California Water Commission and have been for three years. I've been all over California, and you know what? These conversations are the same up and down the state, but what I'm also seeing up and down the state is places like Los Angeles, the citizens a few years ago, agreed to tax themselves $300 million a year in perpetuity to establish a... Um, stormwater capture and groundwater recharge program because they think they can actually collect a third of their water going forward once this is all set up. And there are communities everywhere that are looking at major investments so that they can secure literally their local water supplies. And I'm talking about communities that actually have access to other water supplies in California. We don't. This is it. So anyway, I, I think that, um, I will also say that I think that we did a really clunky job in getting this out there, um, and that that absolutely needs to improve, and it's been a stinging experience for me, um, and, and so I empathize with everybody in the room about that, and Mimi kept saying to me, well, why didn't you bring us in earlier? We could have understood what was going on and could have participated, and I think that we have, to, we absolutely, the my notes all through it say how we have to do things better because I think I, and one of the things that I also struggle with and I'll finish with this is you'll hear people say our water district and actually it should say we we always should say your, yours include includes ours you know because really we I do think of it that way and I'm not a permanent fixture on this board and I know that for sure um, but anyway I'm thinking about the future I've been here, living in this county since 1983, and we've got a lot of work to do. Who on the board takes the lead on finance? No, I, I, I just, we, we can talk after the meeting. Who does? Director Ressa? Finance. We have, we have a finance staff, and we have financial consultants, and we have legal consultants. Director Russell? Our ears are open. We're listening. As I said to Karen, we have 100 meetings a year. Don't wait for two years to attend these meetings only. If you want to know what we're doing and you want to see what we're doing, you have 100 opportunities. Um, I grew up in the water business. My father worked for LA Water and Power for 30 years. I've run a consulting firm for 40 years. I advised water clients all over the world, including the European Union. And, uh, you know, 
it costs money to run these districts. When I first ran for election in 2004, the thing that I pointed out to the IJ and to my opponent is that the water board is a fundamentally different animal than something like a school board. We protect your health and safety. It's as simple as that. We make a mistake, there's consequences of a mistake. We're always looking ahead and back, but mostly ahead, to try and solve problems. As an engineer, I have a PhD from Berkeley in water engineering, and my son has a PhD, he works for me in, from Stanford in water engineering, and I've trained him to look around the corner and over the hill without having to go there. That's the key to engineering, is being able to see things without having to experience them. That's what I'm trying to bring to this board. And what we're trying to do is to create a structure that exists. It's always easy to spend money. That's the simple thing to do. It's always easy to borrow money. That's the simple thing to do. The hard part is to tighten the belt, live within the budget, and move forward. That's what we're doing now. We're putting this system on a good financial footing so that in the future there is an MMWD. And you keep borrowing money and borrowing money. You know, look at it from a pragmatic standpoint. There's a cost of doing business, an annual cost to run the district. Whether you borrow the money or you put the money out of your pocket, sooner or later the average is going to be that number. So you, you need to pay your share, I need to pay my share, the future needs to pay their share. How they pay it, sure, you can manipulate the bonds around and, and take advantage of that, and we've tried to do that. We've refinanced, we've saved millions of dollars of interest. But now it's time to pay the man and to move this thing forward, and that's what we're trying to do. But thank you for being here. Is Director Kohler on the line still? I'm here. Do you want to say anything? <laughs> um, I, I, I think all I want to say is I want to thank everybody who has participated, um, the members of the public who have stuck with us through this, and I, we really haven't done a good enough job of thanking the staff, which has spent, you know, several years and, you know, countless hours trying to address everybody's concerns. I, I don't want to repeat what everybody else has said, but I think it is, um, you know, I think it bears underscoring that um, these are complicated issues and that um, we're not going to, I guess a lot of people have said this, we're not going to make everybody happy, but I think there's been an unusual, you know, extraordinary effort to accommodate all of the issues that have been raised, and I'm, I'm just very proud of the work that the district has done here, so I just want to thank everybody for hanging in there, and I know it's only 11 for you, but it's, you know, 12, 15 for me, so um, I, I don't want to really delay things any further. So, uh, oh, and I will also say, I'm sorry, one last thing. I do need Ben or, to, or somebody who has a better microphone to um, uh, walk through the changes that are being proposed because um, the sound just hasn't been good. So I understood that there were three changes that are being proposed, and I think I'm fine with them, but I, I think it's important that we really get clear on what they are so that we don't get down the road and have everybody, you know, have different views about what was proposed. So that would be, I would really appreciate that. Okay, that's a good idea. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, the, um, I, I think we're looking at these, Cynthia, as not changes per se to the ordinance, but direction staff would be receiving from the board. Um, Larry Russell had an initial one on enhancements to the Super Saver program that staff will be coming back to a subsequent board meeting to um, provide feedback and considerations along those lines of his proposal. Um, then we have three that Director Bragman suggested. One is um, changing from the four-year check-in process to a two-year check-in process. And specifically what we mean by that is in two years, um, aligned with the development of our biannual, our two-year budget, that staff would review the capital maintenance fee for adequacy to fund the CIP in light of our ongoing efforts of our asset management program and what's it indicating? Um, is the need going down? Is it going up? 
where are we in terms of our wildfire task force and gaps that may have identified and the like. But also talking about some of the process issues that have been brought up tonight and previously. Um, how, how is it going? Are there things we can do to refine the approach um, as we um, better understand the capital maintenance fee and discuss that with the board and with the public? And then the um, second item that Director Bregman had was to ensure that staff would develop a separate discrete tracking program, tracking accounting system and reporting approach for the new capital maintenance fee um, for a number of reasons, but to ensure that those funds are used for the purposes as described, um, namely, and that we're reporting out appropriately on that. And then the third item that he requested is that the board consider that staff would um, work with public agencies in the district, school districts, cities, to um, do water audits that we do as a matter of course for the water conservation program but we would focus that on public agencies to get those out and to provide assistance for um, right sizing their meter sizes um, to um, all designed of course to both conserve water and um, lessen the impact of the CMF. Could I just, um, on the um, <clears throat> check-in in two years, I'd like to see us um, re-engage with our um, cost of service analysis to take another look at different approaches as we did for this fee. Yes, we can do that. Um, for clarity, um, the, the plan going forward would be that that would be uh, a process we would engage, report out to the board and the public and, you know, take feedback and make some course corrections. We are not um, at this point envisioning that that would um, impact the four-year um, Prop 218 process that we're concluding um, potentially tonight. Okay, that's uh, that's a start. <laughs> okay, is everybody clear? Okay. Director Bragman, um, before we go forward, I just would like to, a minute to talk about what constitutes. Thank you. Um, before we go forward, I'd just like to talk about what constitutes the record of the proceeding tonight. May I? Okay. Uh, first of all, um, on the dais and available to the public is a letter to me from um, Mike Colantuno and Amy Sparrow. This legal memorandum um, is a response to a letter we received uh, last Thursday around noon from the McNeil Law Firm. Um, this will be entered into the record. I think the record should also reflect that we received an additional 99 um, protests tonight. Uh, we have not had a chance to validate them, but even if they were all considered valid, uh, they wouldn't constitute a majority protest. Um, and back to the record, uh, the record of the proceeding includes all the meeting packets and related presentations um, of the Board of Directors, Finance, District Operations, and Communications Committees from July 17, July 2017 through May 2019. Um, all of the community presentations that were made to special interest groups, the community rate workshop presentations, the ordinances and the resolutions pertaining to the water rates, um, fees, services, and charges, the Prop 218 notice and the mailing information. Um, and then there are all the financial reports, which are the, the audits, the Corolo 2017 Final COSA, the Raftelis Water Financial Plan 2019. Um, uh, the strategic plan, the proposed 10-year CIP, which is attached to the staff report. Um, the 
uh, citizens advisory committee uh, meetings, the presentations and the meeting tapes, and also all the testimony here tonight. Thank you. Just as far as the accounting of the funds, um, my preference would be to that that should be added to the ordinance. That's an easy thing to add. So what's Can we the do pleasure that? of the it's possible to do it, yes. What's okay. the pleasure of the board? I think it's an easy thing to do. Actually, I think it's a good idea. What complications does that present? It's, it, it's not complicated at all. We'll add it as a finding. We can add it as um, uh, number four number 43 and it could read something like this revenue from the uh, CMF will be annually accounted for separately and reported out to the board of directors and also this is something that will show up on our annual audit and so it's something that people can just go and put their finger right on it So, so the first order of business is the um, uh, resolution. We, we need a resolution. We need an, a motion, a second, and a roll call vote on um, resolution eight five three eight, which is the environmental review. We need we need that. Yes, separate, please. Then I'll move approval of resolution eighty five thirty eight regarding the environmental review of ordinance number four four two. I'll second. Okay, roll call vote. Director Gibson? Aye. Director Quintero? Aye. Director Russell? Aye. Director Kohler? Aye. And President Bragman? Aye. I'll make a motion to approve ordinance number 442. With the amendment of the amendment. finding number 43? As, as amended, yeah. Second. Roll call vote, please. Director Gibson? Aye. Director Quintero? Aye. Director Russell? Aye. Director Kohler? Aye. President Bagman? Aye. No matter carries. Okay, folks, that's all she wrote. We're adjourned.